All right, what's happening out there, everyone? Hope you're all well. Welcome along to another episode of Martin's World. Guys, um, just before we get into it, um, if you want to support the show, if you want to support cannabis legalization in Ireland, you can do it by signing up for a Patreon. It's, Mar- it's patreon.com forward slash Martin's World. Um, you can also make donations through Bitcoin, uh, it, through the website, martinsworld.ie. There's a little button up there, uh, it's easy enough uh, to, to follow along. Um, so if you'd like to support the show, um, if you'd like to support the, the fight for cannabis legalization in Ireland, um, you can do so by making a small donation there. All of the money used will be used for setting up and running a cannabis activist hub in Cork City. So guys, uh, today's interview is going to be with Danny Nemu. I had the absolute pleasure of sitting in for a talk by Danny Nemu a couple of years back in UCC, where he talked about drugs in the Bible. Um, it, it was quite a, an in-depth uh, conversation just around uh, the, the translations and uh, misinterpretations that exist within the Bible. Um, we talk about uh, the presence of cannabis or possibly what he believes to be cannabis in the Bible and evidence there suggesting uh, that it was in there. So guys, um, Danny Nemo is a writer, activist and ayahuasca researcher with academic background in the history and philosophy of medicine. He first encountered ayahuasca when living in Japan and eventually followed a trail back to the source of the daimi religion in the Brazilian Amazon. He was bitten by a sandfly while there and uh, that proved to be a great teacher for uh, in the resulting eight months he had a battle with a necrotic parasite and um, that provided a window into the daimi ritual technologies and an opportunity to explore the meaning of illness and health from a different point of view and um, basically during the the couple of months there that he was suffering with this uh, parasite he done a lot of ayahuasca ceremonies um, interest uh, also include traditional perspectives from both indigenous culture and scripture and traditional modes of engagement with areas of human experience usually dominated by academic pharmaceutical and state bodies health and neurodiversity insight and innovation psychedelics and extraordinary experience his books science revealed and nora apocalypse which were bestsellers and available to buy from psychedelic press uk if you'd like to find his website you can at nemusend.co.uk that's n-e-m-u-s-e-n-d dot co UK. So guys, without any further ado, um, I give you my interview with Danny Nemu. Danny Nemu, it's a, an absolute pleasure to have you along. Uh, thanks very much for giving me your time out the, this morning. Uh, I imagine it is morning time. Uh, where do I find you this morning? Uh, where do you find me in Hastings uh, on a rainy day? Uh, yeah, excited. Looking forward to it. Yeah, so you're facing some lockdown measures like us uh, here as well in, in Ireland. <laughs> great news to be waking up to this morning. Like, ah, uh, great fun. It's the new normal. I haven't looked at the news yet. I don't know what horrors are coming from Whitehall uh, at the moment. But, um, yeah. It's a great opportunity for, for people like us to, to get our foot in the door there to, to introduce people to the ideas and topics which we're going to discuss, discuss which is maybe uh, demystifying some of the... The, the kind of uh, the misconceptions that have been put out there um, that there, you know, there are no drugs in the Bible. <laughs> um, so then you were over in, uh, in Ireland with us uh, as, as a guest that uh, you spoke about drugs in the Bible. This is where I first encountered this. And um, you, you talked about uh, some misinterpretations in the Bible. Um, could you just uh, tell me again about that, uh, the very opening part of the Bible? Um, because I think that's a nice opener for, for the guest today. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, back to Ireland. I had a great time in Ireland. Uh, just checking out universities. There. I remember one place. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember one place uh, the students for sensible drug policy were flyering. In the corridor, and one of the professors took one look at the flyer and said, I'm not going to do the accent. There's no drugs in the quite an interesting response from an academic. Um, so yeah, that t- tends to be what, we, what people think. There's no drugs in the Bible. And the other thing that people think is that the Bible is a boring book. And I'm going to try and uh, cover both of these things. Um, and so let's start off with the first, I mean, you're going right off into the deep end there, into Hebrew and the structure of it. But let's, 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 let's go there because we will get to the drugs in a bit. And there are plenty of them and they're, put together in very interesting combinations. 
and it reveals a really interesting, profound understanding of synergy and psychopharmacology that was, you know, far, far in advance of, of anything we had even in the early 20th century. Um, but so just parking the drugs for a bit and looking at the Bible itself as a text, right? The first line of the Bible, um, I might, I'm wondering how to do this in order to visualize it for you. Um, the first line of the Bible says in Hebrew, Bereshit bara Elohim et hashemayim ve'et ha'aretz. Bereshit bara Elohim, that's the first three words. And that tends to be translated as in the beginning, that's Bereshit, in the beginning, created Elohim, God. Or in the beginning, God created, then it goes on to say the heavens and the earth. And um, uh, there's a book written called A Commentary on Genesis by Nachmanides. He's the, one of the greatest of all Jewish sages uh, of all time. And he says the following. He says that the, the, the Bible is written in black fire on white fire and it's written without any spaces. Yeah. And he says, if you divide the words up differently, it reveals different names of God and different secrets. Um, so what are we talking about here? Uh, well, first that we know that at the time of, we know that inscriptions from Paleo-Hebrew, which is the language that the Bible was written in, the text doesn't have spaces. The few inscriptions we have, it, doesn't, it isn't written with spaces. <clears throat> um, and when you write something without spaces, it changes the meaning quite a lot. So for example, I'm a hypnotherapist, that's my job. Um, in my website, uh, it says Danny D hypnotherapy. It doesn't say Danny D hip. Uh, hypnotherapist because if you break up the words differently that becomes Danny D hypno the rapist and that's what happens when you break up words differently in the English language right and then you move over to Hebrew which is a much more complex language in that it doesn't really have vowels or at least the vowels are not written in the text so in the same way that hut and hit and hat and hot are all different words in English and they're all, they're all written differently in English. In Hebrew, if those were words, they would be written the same. It would be a, a, a consonant H and a consonant T. So when you break up different words, or even when, you, even when you just pronounce a specific word in the text, you actually have a whole load of options as to how to pronounce it, right? As it's translated into Greek and then it's translated into English, the, the meaning gets fixed or rather the pronunciation gets fixed. And that means that the meaning gets fixed. So there's different examples of that. I guess a really salient example is the word arum and arom, uh, which is used to describe the snake. And one of those, I won't go into too much detail here, but one of those says, and the snake was more subtle than any creature that Yahweh Elohim had made. And the word is subtle. Whereas if you go to the previous verse, you have the same letters being used to describe Adam and Eve. And it says they were naked and they were not ashamed. Now those same letters mean naked in one sentence and the very next sentence those same letters mean subtle and they're used to describe Adam and Eve being uh, innocent and then the snake as being evil now that's the same word in Hebrew it's pronounced arum in one example and arom in another example well that's convention uh, the same way that you pronounce things differently to what I pronounce actually it's not the same way that we have different accents it's a it's a it's a different reading of the same word right so back to the first, the first, the first word of the Bible, Bereshit, has the following letters, Beit, Resh, uh, Aleph, uh, Shin, Yod, and uh, Tav, right? Uh, if you take, I think I got that right, if you take the last two letters off the first word and stick it on the next word, right? Or if you, so if you take those last two letters off, it becomes Bere, Barosh Yitbara. So Bereshit Bara, which means in the beginning created, goes to Barosh Yitbara, right? Because that re from Bereshit becomes a ro from Barosh. And Barosh means in the head, yeah? And the word created becomes passive, i.e. was created, or is created, or is being created. Again, because the vowels, because the, the tense structure is different in Hebrew. So by shifting two letters from one word to the next word, which is recommended by Nachmanides. And in fact, this, this, this guy, 
this is the example he gives. He said, look how we can mess with the Bible. Look how we can divide it up differently. If you change the first phrase in the Bible by shifting those two letters, look what happens. He doesn't, trans well, he doesn't need to translate it because he's writing in, um, I think he's writing in Aramaic. But anyway, so the, ch the, the, the meaning changes from in the beginning, God created to in the head is created God or in the head are created the gods is another way of looking at it because Elohim, this word Elohim is a plural looking word. The im is a, is a masculine plural. So El, El means power, Elim means powers. And then Elohim is even more complicated because it's putting in a feminine letter, ha, into that word, Elohim. So male, female, plural and singular, abstract and concrete, powers in the head was created the powers or in the head are being created the powers right which is a very different way of starting the bible and the bible is a story which has all kinds of experience that we might describe as um psychedelic we might describe as um mystical we have people hearing voices we have people seeing visions we have people being filled with compulsions um all the kind of things that you would see in a mental home or in a monastery um, so, so that's the beginning of the line. Brosh yitbara Elohim. In the beginning was created the gods or God, and then the line continues. It says in the in the in the Hebrew that we're familiar with, which is normally translated, "In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth." That is, uh, bara Elohim et hashamayim et haaretz. If you met, if you do similar kind of moving of letters from one word to the next then that line becomes atashamayim you are heavens and uh ata uh uh etashamayim etaret and uh ata uh vaaret you are heaven and you are earth in the beginning sorry in the head is created god you are heavens and you are earth which is a very very different way to start a book now that book is a fantastic book and is an extremely fluid book and it has, you know, it has gender fluidity, for example. Noah is described as she. Eve is described as he. It has these words which kind of have the grammar around them, which is, which is singular, like Elohim, whereas the actual, the ending is, is, uh, is plural, right? So this is very, very complex. And a particular, particular phrase, I'll give you another example, um, when, the, when Adam and Eve, they, 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 they eat the fruit, and the the scales fall from their eyes and it says the line says now you will know now you'll be you'll become as gods knowing uh knowing good and evil right but now it's not clear from the hebrew if it's now it's now you become as gods but unlike the gods you're going to know the difference between good and evil or now you're becoming like gods uh and like them knowing good and evil, because it's very, very um, flexible poetically. And right, so it opens up, if, you, if you're prepared to uh, give up your conceptions of the Bible, and I think in Ireland, a lot of people have done that a long time ago, <laughs> um, then, um, then it opens up a whole vista of moral uh, intrigue where, you know, the patriarchs behave like absolute assholes, they're pimping their wives, uh, and their daughters, and uh, just behaving absolutely awfully. The, 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 guy, the, the idea that the patriarchs are good guys is, um, it, I, I mean, it's, it's an amazing example of, um, of, 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 of mind control, really, uh, by not just the Catholic Church, but the Jewish authorities before them. Um, so something, yeah, but it, when I heard you speak uh, those words uh, at that talk in UCC those years ago, I actually had my young daughter with me too, because uh, her kind of grandparents are kind of very religious and things and uh, I've no problem with that I respect everyone's views but I do see the Bible as a as a very good book full of very good stories and parables all of these uh, like very good values in there but there is a lot of twisting of words uh, because like even the opening like if it was to be read in the way in which like uh, you kind of translated it it's actually much more in empowering to the individual reading the book rather than relying on what is maybe something perceived as an outside source, a God that you have to commune with through the Pope or something, you know, rather than a God that's actually in your own head that you can kind of create and commune with through maybe some of the other plants and things that uh, have also been hidden within the Bible and 
through again these uh, misinterpretations of the words. And again, like uh, what you're doing is it's it's not a as far stretch of the imagination as you said. There is no spaces when they were writing these words, so it's a simple thing. Yeah, uh, when they want it, how how many versions were actually put forward when they done the translations? You know. <laughs> um. There's a legend there that when the first, when the Bible was first translated into Greek, um, then I think it was 70 different scholars went into 70 different cells and they all miraculously produced the same Bible, same translation into Greek. And then uh, the, the, the sun didn't shine for three days. <laughs> so there's kind of two, there's two miracles that happen at the same time. One's are kind of considered a good one. One's considered a bad one. The Bible in translation is, described as a, a lion in a cage yeah a lion in a cage it's got all that power but it's bound by those bars um the, you know the, we, a quran is not considered a quran if it's not in english uh, uh sorry if it's not in arabic right um the bible is, is a hebrew book written in a in language which is totally different and, a, and from a culture which is totally different as well and you bring up something which i just want to touch on there before we get you know before we spark up the bong um, but um, the, this conception of God, so when, when we talk about communing with God, uh, or communing with Elohim, let's say, there's a lot of different gods, there's a lot, of little, there's a lot of different God names, right? You've got Elohim, who I just mentioned. Elohim never turns up in the story. He's always outside the story. He's kind of, um, he's in charge of the seasons and that kind of stuff. But when we're talking in the story, we're talking about a different bunch of God names. Yahweh is a common one, but there's other ones. Uh, El Shaddai uh, is another one, for example. They all behave very differently, as do people with different names do behave differently. And also, you know, when I get called dad, I behave in a certain way. When I get called Danny, I behave in a different way, you know. And when I get called asshole, I behave in a third way. You know, these are all appellations of me. Um, uh, but they all bring out different sides in me. And um, when, when, the God, when, when the prophets are dealing with Yahweh, for example, uh, they argue with him. Yeah, you, you, the, the idea that God's kind of in charge and, and we're at his mercy is not biblical. It's not, certainly not Jewish. Um, Noah, for example, the, the flood of Noah is called Noah's flood. It's not, called, it's not called God's flood. It's called Noah's flood. And in the Zohar, the rabbis look at this and they say, why is it called Noah's flood? And they say, it's called Noah's flood because he didn't argue with God. And what happened when he didn't argue with God? The entire world got destroyed, you know. That's what happens if you don't argue with God. Yeah. Um, when when um, El Shaddai comes to um, comes to Moses, it comes to Abraham, sorry, and says there's really bad stuff going on over there in Sodom. Mo, uh, Abraham says, well, he says, I'm going to go and destroy it. And he says, well, you, would you would you spare it for, t for 50 good men? And the God, the God name goes, yeah, I guess I would. Well, what about what about 40? What about 25? What about 10? And he argues him down until he gets as far as Lot who is uh, his, his relative, and he says, don't destroy, don't destroy it. He argues with him, and because of it, Lot gets saved, right? There's examples all the way through with that. There's, there's like, uh, Yahweh decides he's going to destroy the Israelites, and Moses says to him, you know, think of the good old days. Uh, don't do this thing. This be far from thee to do. And Yahweh repented of the evil which he thought to do, right? So there's the word evil, or ra, bad. It's, it's, the, it's the adjective used to describe the guy that we tend to think is the good guy, right? The snake, as I mentioned before, he gets the adjective subtle, which is, which is also means naked, it also means prudent. Um, the word evil is only very specifically uh, given to Yahweh. And even Yahweh says in Isaiah, I create light and darkness. I, uh, I'm mangling the quote a little bit here. Uh, I create light and darkness, I, uh, I create evil. Uh, I do all of these things, right? So right there in the text, we know that we know that the God names create evil, and we know that the uh, the prophets who are the who are the really you know the best characters in the Bible, let's say, uh, they argue with they argue with God. In fact, the name Israel, which is given to Jacob, uh, Jacob's Jacob's name in Hebrew means usurper because he basically nicks his brother's birthright and cons him out of his uh, cons him out of his inheritance it's called a usurper but then he has a fight there's a scene where where um he fights with this uh, either god or an angel it's not clear and he pins him this this angel like dislocates his thigh 
but he manages to pin him. He fights him all night. And then in the morning, he says, what's your name? Which is where you get control of, 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 of um, in, in the, well, that's a whole other story. But in the occult sciences, you tend to get control of a demon or the control of a spirit by learning its name. He pins it and he says, what's your name? And God says to him, who are you asking me my name? Now you're going to be called Israel because Israel means he who fought with God and won. Yeah. So that's where the name of the Israelites comes, comes from. He who fought with God and won. Got a bit off topic, topic there, didn't I? No, no, not at all. Like uh, I'm actually learning quite a bit. I didn't know that that's what Israel actually even meant. <laughs> uh, um, and how did you actually even get into all this, Danny? Uh, what led you into this pathway? <laughs> Before was, we get into um, the deeper stuff. I was, I was sitting at home in Manchester um, doing, my, doing my degree yeah. uh, in my early 20s. And I was smoking a joint. I was stoned. And uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses turned up at the door. Lovely guys to talk to. I love them. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and so I, I had, at that time, I was, I was preparing my dissertation. And my dissertation was going to be on, on um, basically the history of medicine. I was looking at some kind of historical, interesting bit of medicine to, to do my dissertation on. And it walked in the Jehovah's Witnesses. And I was like, oh, yeah, you guys don't do blood transfusions, do you? And I, and I was interested in their views on medicine. Yeah. Um, my, academic background is a history and philosophy of medicine and it's still something I'm fascinated by which is making coronavirus just completely fascinating to watch from my window uh <clears throat> kind of comparing that to what happened during the black death and so on and so forth um <laughs> but so in what the Jehovah's Witnesses and we had a we had a chat and by the end of the chat I decided I wanted to compare um the Jehovah's Witnesses and uh American, early American kind of pioneers, early American Protestants, so 1600s, Puritans. And what if those two groups have something in common. They're both apocalyptic. They're both really interested in the end. Yeah. Um, this was part of, the, part of the pioneers project was to go and found New Jerusalem in the new world. Yeah, to rebuild it because the old world, because Europe was just dominated by the devil and, um, and off we go. Uh, so both of the, those, both these, firstly, both of these groups had um, uh, a vision of an impending um, eschaton, an impending uh, uh, doom, mm -hmm. and um, perhaps renewal as well. And they also have some funny ideas about the body, because the Puritans, uh, at that particular time, there was a big revolution in medicine, and you get statistical medicine, you get nosology, you get kind of, um, you get a whole load of branches of medicine, which which come alive at that particular, uh, particular point in history. So that's where I started. I was looking at the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Puritans and their views on sex, um, the body and health. And I very quickly, because they're both apocalyptic, so I started reading the apocalyptic parts of the Bible, <clears throat> um, Book of Daniel, um, for example. And in the Book of Matthew, I think it's Matthew, there's this line um, which says, basically, at the end, there's going to be uh, at the end of the world, um, there'll be all these bad things happen. There'll be wailing and the, the bad will be cast into a pit of fire. And again, I'm mangling the quote. But that word world isn't the word world. In Greek, it's the word aeon, right? At the end of the aeon, there'll be all kinds of bad stuffs happening. And I kind of look, I thought that's interesting because aeon doesn't mean world, you know, in English or in Greek. And I thought, well, why, did, why has the King James Version translated this word wrongly? It's complete, it's, it's, it's not a... You know, it's, it's, not even, it's not a mistake, it's an error, uh, and it's a deliberate error. And the reason is because King James had asked his translators to make the Bible as non-controversial as possible, as close to another Bible, which they already had, the Bishop's Bible, as possible. And this was in a time of, you know, revolution in England. You had, um, it was a big fight going on, and, you know, King, King, King Charles would lose his head around then as well, not, not too far away, um, uprisings. And so this Bible was a, was a propaganda machine, basically, mm -hmm. to... Um, to do away with certain ideas. Like the, the, the Puritans were agitating for a new aeon, for a new epoch or a new age. You know, that uh, we might talk about the Age of Enlightenment, the Iron Age, all these kind of ages. They were looking for uh, uh, an age that was parliamentary age and was the, was the end of this kind of um, awful uh, British crown whose effect has been, been a, you know, felt all around the world, no, not, not least where you're from. Um, so... Uh, uh, 
So this idea, of, you know, it's very difficult to think about the end of the world. No one wants to think about the end of the world, but a lot of people want to think about the end of the epoch, you know, uh, with glee, you know, I'm looking out the window and I'm thinking, well, this is, this is toasty, isn't it? Um, looking at the American elections, thinking, oh gosh, well, I'm, I'm glad I'm not there, but it looks like the end of something and I'm getting excited about it. So people get excited about that kind of thing. And King James didn't want that. Um, so I started looking into the apocalyptic parts and the first talk I gave on the Bible was at an anarchist conference and it was called Mistranslation in the Service of, of, of Empire. And I was looking at various different lines um, and I'll just give you one of those actually, which is, I think it's quite interesting. Um, it's from the front of my, that's my first book, which has just been re-released. It's my second book, Neuro Apocalypse. But so there's a line which you'll probably be familiar with because it's in the New Testament and the Old Testament as well. Uh, which says the meek shall inherit the earth. Yeah, the meek shall inherit the earth. <clears throat> now, in the Old Testament, uh, so what, what words have we got there? The word meek is is anav, right? Anav doesn't normally mean meek. Moses is described as the meekest man in all all the world, right? And Moses challenges Pharaoh. You know, when Moses doesn't successfully wipe out all the all the all the you know all the boys. And, and women in a, during a, a raid on a town, uh, or when his men don't, Moses gets cross about it. So Moses is not meek. Moses is genocidal uh, and tough guy. Um, and uh, so the man Moses was very meek, for example, it says. So anav normally means poor, yeah? It sometimes means uh, poor in spirit in the sense that you follow your instructions from God, but generally it means poor, anav. Uh, yarash, which is translated in that line's inherit is more normally sees, yeah. And you can look this up in the Bible. You can go into the Bible. You can go into Blue Letter Bible. You can see how many times the word um, yarash is found. How many times that's translated as inherit? Almost none. How many times is it translated as sees? Nearly always, right? So the poor shall sees uh, eretz. Eretz doesn't mean the earth. They didn't even know that the earth, they didn't even know the earth was a thing, you know, they had the idea of a land. Eretz Israel is the land of Israel, you know. Um, it, means, it means a land or a, a piece of territory. The poor shall seize territory is a very different translation to the meek shall inherit the earth. And there's a whole different political, uh, there's a whole different politics behind it. Now that is much more um, appropriate to my politics. It's also much more appropriate to, to the language of the Bible as well, you know. I'll just give you one more example. Um, the word seller, which is rib, you know, the idea of uh, Adam and Eve and uh, the man gets his rib taken out and that gets made into a woman, right? The word there is seller. Uh, it's not translated as rib anywhere else in the Bible except for that story, right? When the Bible wants to say rib, it doesn't say rib. You know, when someone gets wounded, they say he got wounded under the fifth. They don't say under the fifth rib because there isn't a word for rib, right? Sela means something else. Uh, Sela means normally flank i.e. half of an army, or it can mean a chamber in a house, right? So a significant proportion of a house or half of it, yeah? Um, so, when, so this idea that a little rib gets taken out and that gets made into a woman is very different to what it says in the text. It says a flank was taken, the wound was closed up, and that side was turned into a woman, right? So that's how I got into it. I got into it looking at it through mistranslation and oppression, uh, and then I got kind of more and more curious about all aspects of it. Uh, and then I just started looking up the drugs, you know, they're, they're very clear. What does cinnamon do? What does cassia do? What does myrrh do? And that's kind of where I got, that's how I ended up in Ireland, really. Yeah, yeah. The, the next part was actually uh, the, the chief spices. Uh, that was something that was very intriguing. And the, the holy anointing oil then as well. Um, like, it, it's just there quite blatantly, as, as you kind of have broken down uh, quite effectively to us, how these different, uh, what you would have, and uh, many people have in their cupboard at home. I, I know I certainly have a couple of these ingredients at home. Um, I don't have all of them, but some of them. <laughs> um, but again, like it's very disempowering the way in which the, the Bible has been translated, um, not just on the patriarchal level, but on the individual level like that. Uh, like. Can you just explain that to people, uh, the, the chief spices and uh, the mistranslation <laughs> or, or the possible mistranslations? Uh. Yeah, so here we're talking about something slightly different. You've got, you've got mistranslation in the Bible, certainly, when it goes from Hebrew to Greek, uh, Greek into English. You've also got interpolations, which is where the actual text of the Bible has been changed, right? Yeah. This is not that. Um, when we're looking at Exodus 30, you've got a list of ingredients um, and... 
a recipe of how to put them together, basically, and then what to do with them. So here we're not really talking, I mean, as far as, I'm, as I understand, this stuff is out in the open, right? Um, there was, there is one of the ingredients of the, of the, the anointing oil has um, four ingredients. And they are, um, and this, this is Exodus 30, you can look it up, right? Um, cinnamon, cassia, myrrh, and then something called kenebosum, yeah? Right, now that word kenebosum, or there's various ways of pronouncing it, um, the research on that has been really done very well by Chris Bennett. And I would kind of um, uh, recommend people to his work, right? Uh, but kenebosum in the singular is kenebos, uh, and um, it means fragrant cane. You know, I'm fond of a fragrant, fragrant caning myself. Um, <laughs> and it's, uh, it's this word which has been mistranslated from a long, long time ago. Like in the first, that first Greek translation I was mentioned, that was just translated as cal calamus. I don't think that that was, um, I think that was just an error. You know, I'm not sure, but I don't think anything is actually being hidden there. I think it was just a mistake because there are lots of mistakes in, 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 in old translations. Um, but if we look at what those things actually are, uh, every culture around um, the ancient kingdom of Israel and Judah was used, had, a, had, a, had cannabis in some form. For example, uh, Herodotus, he visits the Scythians, which are a little bit to the north of Israel, in about 500 BC. And he says um, they, they pin the flaps of their tents down mm -hmm. and then they burn cannabis on the fire and and then they jump up and they sing and dance and it's better than any Grecian vapor bath, right? Um, what we're talking about there is a hot box. So let's just talk a little bit about the hot box and I'm gonna come back to the, I'm gonna come back to the specifics of what, of, of the ingredients in the hot box in a minute. Um, but, the, but the tabernacle. They had Toyota Corollas, yeah. <laughs> they, they had hot boxes before they had Toyotas. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, hot boxes have been around for ages. For, uh, there are, there are Chinese sages who were burning cannabis in their, their cells. Uh, there was the Oracle at Delphi who was um, burning a, a, a mix of um, laurel and I think henbane was in there. I think myrrh was in there. I forget exactly the ingredients there uh, in a cave. You know, the idea of, and like I said, um, this, this quote from, from Herodotus about, uh, about the Scythians, this was a technique which was well known in the Middle East. Um, and uh, there's actually a recent discovery uh, at Tel Arad. Um, there was a, a couple of months ago, there was um, uh, an excavated site, which has been known about for a while, was tested. Um, and some of the residues were found to contain uh, Yeah, cannabis and frankincense were found there. And again, this is a very small chamber. You can, you can see it. It's, it's got enough space for a few people, tightly sealed. So this... This um, format of a room goes all the way back to the Bible, um, goes back to Exodus and the construction of the tabernacle. Yeah? yeah, the tabernacle is a tent, and the tent has a has a, a, a chamber at the back of the tent, and the chamber is four and a half meter cubed. Uh, it's very very tightly sealed. It's got um, four different materials sealing this thing. It's got a frame. So it's got a kind of like a wooden, big wooden box. And then the, the tent material was pulled, two of, the, two of the, the cloths are pulled very tightly over this, over this frame. The second two are kind of out like this as a windbreak. But one of those is, it's a kind of leather we know that was used to make shoes. So it's an impermeable, strong leather, right? And then at the, at the, uh, at the entrance to it, you've got a, a veil. And a veil, we normally think of a veil as like a curtain, right? To keep prying eyes out of places. But the veil has, there's two veils in the tabernacle. There's a veil right at the door, and then there's a second veil to the inner chamber. And that second veil to the inner chamber is described with a different word. And in the, in the Jerusalem temple, which is based on the tabernacle, uh, um, it, the thickness of it is the thickness of a man's hand, right? A, 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 the hand span. So it's an immensely thick, curtain you know in the time of the temple again it took 10 men to raise this thing right so it's a it's a basically a, a wall which is sealing this four and a half meter cubed box what's in the box the the ark of the covenant um which is a magic box which contains um it's said to contain the um the ten commandments so that's a whole different story they're not actually ten of them um and they're not commandments um but I don't know if we're going to get to that. But the Ark of the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Alliance, and I think it's the kind of alliance we're talking about with a shamanic alliance between 
a, a tribal god and the tribe, you know, or a, or a shaman and his familiar spirit. Um, so that's the only thing it contains. And when, when the high priest goes in, he goes in carrying um, a censer, right, which is where you burn coals, and handfuls of finely ground uh, incense. Yeah, we're not talking about a little stick of, um, of patchouli here. We're talking about handfuls of finely ground incense. And I've burned these incenses uh, in um, confined rooms, right? You can do this for yourself. You're like, if you just burn some frankincense and some cannabis in your bath, uh, and sit there in the smoke, you're going to learn a little bit about Yahweh, <laughs> oh, okay. I think. Um, <laughs> I recommend it. So, it. so basically burning, and, and the incense, I'll get onto the incense in a minute, but there's 16 different ingredients, mm -hmm. and about 12 of them, 10 or 12 of them are psychoactive. Yeah. Um, but before the high priest does this, um, all of the priests get together and they put on the anointing oil, right? Oh. Uh, it's called Temen Hamishcha in Hebrew. And it comes from the word... Uh, masha, which means to paint or to wipe, looks like it's the same root as our word massage, right? Through the Arabic, through the French into English. Um, so we think of the anointing ritual, the chrism or something like that, as a little bit of oil dribbled on the forehead. Or, um, uh, it looks like back in the day, this was, this was a, a massage, massaging uh, all over the body, um, this mixture. And what's the mixture? Cinnamon, cassia, myrrh and canebosum <clears throat> and um canebosum is almost certainly cannabis um from linguistic evidence we know from archaeological evidence we know that there was cannabis being burned and used as a massage oil in jerusalem around the same time we know it's in egyptian medicine uh etc etc we know it's in persian medicine as well um so uh so cannabis, we don't really need to talk about because we know what topicals do with cannabis. But the other, the other three, myrrh is interesting. Myrrh works on the opioid system, mm -hmm. uh, mu opioid receptors. Uh, so if you smoke myrrh, you will know about it. Smoking myrrh is very pleasant. Smoking, uh, smoking myrrh mixed with cannabis, wonderful stuff. Absolutely <laughs> great. <clears throat> um, uh, you know, go, go, go easy with your doses. You know, there, there's, there's taboos in this stuff in the Bible. Uh, saying you're not meant to mix this stuff up, stuff up if you're a commoner. And if you, make, if you put this on a stranger, you get cast out. And there's a whole bunch of taboos around it. Another one is that when you've got the oil on you, you're not allowed to go out of the tabernacle. The priests, who are the only people who are allowed to take it, um, put the oil on, they have to stay where they were, right? So it's a good trip guide. Don't go stumbling through the streets uh, of your city when you're, when you're fried, right? So, so what I'm saying is take care with the doses because these things are strong. But um, yeah, myrrh, Myrrh, myrrh is there in the Bible as a painkiller. When Jesus is on the cross, he gets offered myrrh in vinegar. Why is it a painkiller? Because it works on opioid, um, opioid receptors. It's also euphorogenic. It makes you happy, myrrh. It's still used in the certain African tribes where they use it, um, they basically suck it at um, um, social occasions. There's Roman, uh, Romans used to drink a cup of myrrh wine at their feasts. And one interesting thing there, we know this from one of the playwrights, is that they only drunk one cup of myrrh wine, right? You didn't drink two cups of myrrh wine. You could have as many, you know, imagine a Roman feast with, I don't know, sheep's eyes and all kinds of bits of stuff. You can have as many of them as you like. It's quite a sumptuous thing. But you only got one dose of myrrh because if you have too much of it, it makes you go to sleep because it works on the opioid system, right? Um, so that's myrrh. Uh, myrrh is also complex. It's got a load of other stuff in it. But, but, um, but then you've got cassia and cinnamon. So what are those two things? They're both species of cinnamon. The, the Chinese cinnamon that you've probably got in your kitchen, the cinnamon you've got in your kitchen is probably Chinese cinnamon. That's cinnamomum cassia. That's its technical name or scientific name. The other one, which is cinnamomum verum, is um, it's a different type of cinnamon. It comes from a different part of the world. Uh, at the moment, they grow it in Sri Lanka and places like that. Uh, so these are two different species of, um, of cinnamon, and they have very interesting pharmacology. Uh, and it's a little bit complicated, so bear with me here. Um, they, are, they work on enzyme inhibition. And enzymes, for those of you who don't know, enzymes are biological catalysts. They speed up reactions in the body and they break down, uh, they break down things that you eat as well. Um, so in, uh, just jumping over to South America for a moment, with ayahuasca, if you, if, uh, ayahuasca, ayahuasca is again complex, but part of its function, part of the way it works, is that it mixes an enzyme inhibitor, which is um, in harmine, harmaline, 
with DMT. So some people will be familiar with DMT. If you smoke DMT, all kinds of crazy stuff happens. That's because it goes through your lungs and it goes into your, it goes across the blood brain barrier, it goes into your brain, does all kinds of funky things. If you eat it, if you eat DMT, if you eat spoonfuls of DMT, what's going to happen is that your monoamine oxidase enzymes are going to break it down in your gut. It's not going to get into your bloodstream. It's not going to get into your brain. It's not going to do very much. Um, so DMT is orally ineffective, but smoked is very, very effective. You can make it orally effective by inhibiting those enzymes. So basically knocking out your defense systems. So when you, so if you mix uh, the, the vine, the ayahuasca vine with the chacruna leaf, you get ayahuasca and uh, the vine contains monoamine oxidase inhibitors. So it contains inhibitors which block the function of those enzymes. And that means that the DMT that you drink in the, in the leaf goes into your brain. I just want to just mention there that it's more complex than that. There is more pharmacology going on than that. Um, when we look at complex systems, which is different to what the ancients did, when the ancients looked at complex systems, they kind of appreciated the complexity, as you're going to see from this example of the tabernacle. When we look at complex systems, we tend to say, oh, I see, it's a receptor and it's an enzyme blocker. And now we understand because we're really clever. Um, I would say we're not clever at all. They were really missing stuff out. So I'm, I'm not, um, you know, I'm not particularly skilled at Hebrew. Uh, I'm not particularly skilled at psychopharmacology, but I do know how to read papers. And I went looking and I found that these two species of cinnamon work on enzymes. So I started looking into the enzymes that they work on. And it's the cytochrome system, right? Cytochrome system is a, a wide variety of enzymes in your body. And it breaks down all of the drugs that you're or 99% of the drugs that you're likely to encounter are broken down by six different enzymes. And they're all part of the cytochrome system, right? And they are called things like, uh, let me just find their names. Um, CYP3A4, CYP2CN, C9, CYP1A2, CYP2E1, and CYP2D6. Those are the um, those are the enzymes which break down 99% of the drugs that you, that, you, that you put into your body that you're likely to find, right? So cinnamon breaks down, or so rather cinnamon inhibits five of them, yeah? So just uh, cinnamon, the body's ability to produce them, essentially. Um, there's two things there. So there's the body's ability to, but you bring up an interesting point and now we're going to have to start talking about pomegranate. So let's just park that for a minute. So you've got your body's ability to produce the enzyme, which is at the DNA level. And then you've got the functioning of the enzyme as it's going about its business, breaking down uh, drugs, yeah? which is a different thing. So it's that second phase that cinnamon interferes with, right? Um, and it's so, so it basically knocks out CYP3A4, 2C9, 1A2, and 2E1. These are, um, but then you still got one left, which is the CYP2D6. And that is not inhibited by cinnamon mumberum, but it is inhibited by cinnamon cassia. And the active ingredient, again, I don't like the term active ingredient, the active ingredient that we, as uh, looking from perspective of pharmacology, understand um, is, 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 is not very, there's not very much of it in cassia. And you will notice that in the recipe for how much cassia and how much cinnamon you put into the mix, you put twice as much cassia as you do for cinnamon, right? Cinnamaldehyde, which is what is in cinnamon and verum and knocks out most of the enzymes. There's loads of that in cinnamon. But the other stuff, the name of which I actually forget at the moment, um, is um, there's not so much of it. So even the recipe suggests that they understood that these two these two together knock out your enzyme system. So what does that mean? It means that the myrrh that you, that you take, which has, um, you know, I've mentioned the opioid, um, the opioid receptor agonist, basically the fact that it works on the same system as heroin and opium, um, that, that um, interaction is much more intense and much more long lasting, right? Because those, um, those chemicals in the myrrh, they're called, it's a difficult word, furanosequester terpenoids, right? Um, they are not broken down by the enzymes because the enzymes are, are asleep, essentially. The cannabis will also do its thing. You know, cannabis obviously does its thing even without those enzymes being inhibited, but it does a whole lot more things, right? Because cannabis is a very complex, um, a very complex plant. The, 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 can, the CB receptors, CB1, CB2, all of those things, they have really complex interactions. 
which is probably, um, I don't even really want to go into them um, too much detail. Um, but the point is that, uh, so, so first the oil is put on people, the enzyme system is inhibited. They also have cannabis and myrrh put upon them. Then what happens is most of the priests go and hang out together and they eat something called the showbread, which I'll come back to in a second. And then the, the, um, the high priest goes off on his own and he goes into uh, this chamber, which I mentioned before, with handfuls of finely ground incense and he burns them. And then he sits there in a cloud seeing angels and talking to angels, right? So the, the stuff that he burns is again, there's a, there's a, there's a whole list of them. Let me see if I can find it. Um, oh, there it is. So you've got um, Stacta, which is high grade myrrh. You've got Galbanum, which is a booster of all kinds of, um, it's a dopamine booster. It's a serotonin booster, increases the amount of neurotrists transmitted in your brain, which means things are firing more. Um, you've got saffron. Saffron's another opioid, uh, works on the opioid system. That's an interesting one. That's a plant from Crocus sativus. It contains crocin. If you give crocin to rats, they get more erections than normal and it alters their mount behavior, right? Um, it's got saffron. So, so this is the bit about myrrh being a, um, uh, not myrrh, sorry, opioid receptor agonist uh, are aphrodisiacs as well. And they're known to be aphrodisiacs. Myrrh, for example, in the Bible, there's another line which says, uh, come, let's take, a, I've perfumed my bed with myrrh and aloes and cinnamon, I think it is. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning, right? There's a very clear connection between myrrh and lovemaking there. Uh, so saffron's another one. Um, costus, uh, which is what's used in joss sticks, that's another aphrodisiac. That's a really interesting one, which is also in the incense because it's neuroprotective. Basically what it does is it protects cells from too much dopamine. If you get too much dopamine in your brain, it can mess with the cells. Uh, so this is neuroprotective. And there's other things in there, spikenard as well. Spikenard is a kind of famous one because Christ, um, there's an ointment which is bought for Christ, an expensive ointment. And Judas goes, why are we spending all this money on ointment when we could be giving it to the poor? And Christ goes, you're always going to have the poor, but you're not always going to have me. Now, the ointment we're talking about there is spikenard. Yeah, um, it's described as very costly. It's a sedative uh, in low doses, it stimulates high doses. Again, serotonin, dopamine, GABA, uh boosters and that's quite interesting because coming back to come back to something else dopamine is used in laying down memories yeah and as we all know thc messes with your shirt short-term memory and if you're the idea of this ritual was divination right the guy was to go in there he was to converse with the angels and then he was going to be useful he was going to be coming back outside and telling people what he'd what he learned in there right um, if you can't remember what you've learned, it's pretty useful. So you've got various different things which are neuroprotective and also it's called nootropics. That means they boost your memory uh, forming capacity. So that's quite an interesting synergy as well. And you've got agar wood, which has got 300 different isolated compounds. And you've got um, onica and frankincense, both, both of which work on the GABA system. And uh, GABA is, uh, that makes them tranquilizers. Yeah, way to test that one out is just get some frankincense Chew it up, don't chew up too much. Chew up the size of about two peas worth, as in two garden peas. And uh, yeah, the frankincense, you will feel the tranquilizing capacity of it. And even the word tranquilizer, I don't really like. It comes from, you know, the mental homes and poor houses and uh, a model of medicine I don't like. It does something interesting to your head um, that puts you in the state of mind for prophecy and problem solving. <laughs> yeah, I had my first taste of frankincense actually that night in, uh, in UCC actually. And uh, yeah, it was actually quite an enjoyable experience. Uh, it wasn't an altered state or anything like that. Like um, I was quite within my, uh, uh, my mind uh, and all that. But um, yeah, it was definitely an enhanced perspective on things uh, for sure. Um, that's quite a complex mix of, uh, of incense there as well that they, that they combine. Like, uh, you have to wonder, like, uh, similar to the ayahuasca and, and the guys in, in the forest, the shamans, the, the ayahuasca arrows, uh, they would tell you that it was the plants that uh, told them how to, to combine it. But there's kind of, that's, a, again, like a, a knowledge that is carried on over there. But here in, in our own traditions in the Bible, um, we're, we're very much keeping this away from people. Like uh, if you're in the church, I don't know, uh, for confirmations uh, here in Ireland, uh, where they conform and commune the, the kids, they go around with the, uh, what did you call it? The serpent? Uh, no. 
yeah, you know, they go around with that and they're, they're blowing the smoke around the place and people are bringing it in. But I'd imagine that's only just a very, very tip, like it's only tipping your toe into what is the ocean of what is the possibilities of uh, these things, you know, that, that what the real traditions are and uh, how we kind of cover them up. To, uh, yeah, well, I mean, so the real power comes through in, in, in synergies, right? So in modern medicine, we tend to take something like maybe saffronal, and then isolate MDMA out of it and give someone a pill of MDMA and something which is, which is um, not found in nature. Now, that's not how the ancients used to work. They used to mix things together in order to um, make them more potent. And the, the pharmacology is really interesting there. So I'll just give you a little bit of an example of, 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 of how that works in, in Tel Arad, which is this, um, um, this uh, it's a shrine in, in, in the south, southern part of the kingdom of Judah, right? This was, an, it was used by the military. So this was a part of the, uh, part of, you know, this is part of state religion. This isn't some bizarre sect in the middle of nowhere. This is part of the state religion. And there was, so there was a shrine and, and inside the shrine were found two standing stones and two altars. And on a, a big standing stone and a small standing stone and a big altar and a small altar, which immediately suggests two gods to anyone who's paying attention. By the time you get to the tabernacle, you don't, you don't have two altars, you have one altar, but you do have two angels on top of the tabernacle, which I think is quite interesting, especially as inside the tabernacle, there's a line which says, don't make graven images. And then it says, make two graven images and put them on top of the box where that rule is, which is all, you know, it's all very confused. And in fact, um, it's a cover up. But um, back to Tel Arad, you've got two standing stones, one of which was found with, found with paint, and then you've got two um, altars. Cannabis residues found on one, frankincense residues found on the other, right? And these two things mix in a fascinating way. And if you're just like, if, if you're just bear with me, I'll just dip a little bit into the psychopharmacology here. Um, and let's, let's think about like THC, for example. THC acts on the CB1 receptor, yeah? Um, the CB1 receptor is um, quite well distributed in the brain. Uh, uh, it's what, you know, it's, it's named after cannabis. And what that does is it um, increases the amount of dopamine in the synaptic cleft. So synapses like this, you've got a, a, a neuron coming in, a nerve cell coming in, then you've got a space and you've got a nerve cell going out. I'm simplifying a little bit. Um, but what happens is an electrical pulse comes down the nerve it releases a bunch of neurotransmitters and chemicals into the synaptic cleft, and that, 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 that message gets translated back into an electrical pulse and off it goes, right? So by, um, by fiddling what's going on in the synapse, you can change whether the next cell fires and you can change all kinds of experiences going on in the brain. So just looking at the dopamine system, uh, THC uh, makes CB1 receptor produce more dopamine, right? That's interesting. Um, but at the other side of the synaptic cleft, um, you've got uh, um, ethyl acetate, which comes from frankincense, mm -hmm. and that inhibits the uh, acetyl, uh, acetyl cholinesterase. Basically, it inhibits an enzyme which uptakes that dopamine. So what does it mean? The, the, the cannabis is acting before the synaptic cleft to increase the amount of dopamine thrown into the synapse, that's one thing, but then the frankincense is working at the other side of the synaptic cleft to make that dopamine sit around in the synaptic cleft longer. So you've got two different parts of the dopamine system uh, working together there and, uh, to increase. And, and it's not the same as taking twice as much cannabis, for example, because you, you, you reach a certain limit in a certain part of the system and then you might start working in another part of the system. So what does dopamine do? We know that dopamine is involved in language production, yeah? Um, when people are excited, they speak a lot. And when people are nervous, they speak less. And when you get stage fright and your dopamine comes tumbling down, you might choke completely and not speak at all, right? Um, there is, uh, um, so that, that's part of, so this, 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 this chamber is called, in Hebrew, it's called Debir. And that comes, that we call it holy, holy is in English, but the chamber, the shrine itself, is called the beard and that's both the tabernacle and also this shrine at Tel Arad and also the the temple of Solomon is called the beard it's the name of this type of chamber the beard comes from the word tabar which means word right it means speaking language it means phrase it means uh, all that kind of stuff um, so the, the connection between speaking and language production and dopamine 
or not, not necessarily doping, is, is right there in the Hebrew word which describes where this all happens, right? Um, what do those prophecies look like? What happens when someone goes into there? They talk to the gods, they listen to the gods, and often they would, like Moses, for example, he comes out of the tabernacle and he starts singing. He speaks in verse, you know? And then his sister Miriam, sometimes will, she'll pick up her, like, her drum and she'll start doing a dance and she'll pick up his tune, right? Very, very similar to shamanic, um, shamanic setup where the, the, the shaman goes off on his own or her own with their, with their ayahuasca or with their power plants. And then they come back to the tribe and they've got instructions, they've got words, and often those words come in song uh, or poetry or something like that. And then if you look at scripture, you know, it's, it's just poetry all the way through, right? Um, I did a talk, uh, did a conference actually about Tel Arad, um, which I will send you, you can stick it in the show notes. But one of the points that Chris Bennett makes is he's talking about how cannabis, um, how in hip hop, you know, uh, people will smoke a blunt and then they'll start spitting uh, verses, you know, rhymes. Um, the, uh, and the connect, I mean, there's, there's, there's no mystery there in the minds of, of a lot of people, you can see in their words, in, in, in rap songs, you know, uh, they're very clearly connecting the smoking of weed with the, production of, with the production of rhymes, right? So we're talking about cannabis and frankincense at the same time working on that same system, right? That's one part of it. Then you've got another, another other, you've also got activity in the, in the GABA system, but it's more, even more exciting, I think, is the trip V3, the trip V ion channels, right? And this theory, which I don't know anyone who's done research here, I'm working with a microbiologist at the moment um, to look a bit deeper into exactly what's going on with trip V. Trip V3. But Trip V3 is an iron channel, yeah, uh, widely distributed in the brain. Um, there's, there's loads and loads of, uh, they're called TRP, uh, TRP um, um, channels, iron channels, yeah. There's loads of them, but this is, one, this is one of them. It's involved in heat sensation, right? When you touch something hot, Trip V3 that's sending that message, the, the message involves Trip V3. It's also involved in uh, kind of capsicum, like chili, uh, some of the trip these are involved in um, eucalyptus and menthol and stuff like that. Um, in your, that's your peripheral nervous system. In your brain, trip V3 is widely distributed, but we don't know what it does, or at least we didn't know very. We don't know very much about what it does. But we do know one thing, and that is that it's involved in migraine and migraine with aura. Okay, uh, and I just want to explain that a little bit. You've got trip V1, which is a story about. I hope this isn't too technical. I hope this is all right. Yeah. Um, so you've got the trip V1 receptor, uh, and it's involved somehow in migraines, but migraine without aura. And then you've got trip V3 receptor, which is involved in migraine with aura. And what's an aura? Aura is the time before a migraine kicks in when all kinds of crazy stuff happens uh, in your visual sphere and in your sensation, right? You also get an aura with temporal lobe epilepsy or epilepsy generally before people have a fit they can have certain experiences. Those experiences can, can be flashes of light, you know, uh, they can be blindness, they can be the sense of presences, yeah? Um, the, and those presences, sometimes before an epileptic fit, people will describe the same presence coming back. It might be the same ancestor, it might be their same auntie. Mm -hmm. Every time they see their auntie, okay, they know they're gonna have an epileptic fit, and it's almost the, it's an, an enunciation in the religious tense, sense of the word, the enunciation, the angel comes along and announces the, uh, this strange experience which is about to happen yeah um, tunnel vision is another one uh, terror and ecstasy deja vu uh, jamais vu which is where you you're somewhere that you know but you you don't recognize um, a lot of these a lot of these um, a lot of these aura symptoms are what you see in in the prophets uh, you see in Daniel for example when Daniel has has his basically it looks like a, an epileptic fit it involves terror and ecstasy uh, it, loss of consciousness in the end, loss of muscle tone, convulsions, hearing voices, right? Very, very familiar to um, a lot of epileptics. Um, also epilepsy, there's been a couple of cases where um, production of language, uh, graphomania, which is where you can't stop writing, that sometimes uh, is, is found along with epilepsy. And there's a really interesting case, which I found about a woman who had her epilepsy medication reduced and the effect of that was for her to compulsively write poetry. And um, she got really, really into it. Um, so we've got, we've got a lot going on there uh, around, um, around so, uh, so back to the trip V3. So we know the trip V3 is involved in uh, migraine with aura, 
and we know that um, it's also involved with temporal lobe epilepsy. Um, the temporal lobe is where, uh, what's the name of it now? Broca's and um, Wernicke's, Wernicke's area, which is the lang language, which is involved in language production is in the, is in the temporal lobe. So it's something I'm kind of looking at um, is what the, the effect of cannabis and frankincense on, on, on those systems uh, because both cannabis and frankincense are anticonvulsant. That means if you give, um, if you, you know, I don't know if you've seen the footage of, of someone taking a joint, having someone smoking a joint whilst they're having an epileptic uh, episode. It's very, very quick anticonvulsant, right? So if, if what they were doing in the, in the tabernacle and in these um, Holy of Holies was messing with the trip V3 system, you know, um, you don't really want that to go beyond a certain, um, strength right so the fact they're using anticonvulsants frankincense is another one frankincense can interrupt a an epileptic fit and it's also preventative so if people have epilepsy they can take it take frankincense less likely to have an epileptic fit um and i guess an, another point there to mention is that the the tabernacle uh when the priest was inside it he used to he used to wear a chain attached to his robe right mm -hmm. so people outside could see if he stopped moving and pretend and maybe so they could kind of drag him out without going in because no one else was allowed to go in so there seems to be an understanding that loss of consciousness and potentially convulsions was part of the whole experience and, and there was a certain danger there as well so so this was the kind of my, our, uh, the age-old uh, harm reduction really um they knew yeah. that they were kind of messing with uh, dangerous stuff so it was like yeah look but we have these other safer things that will reduce the harms <laughs> interesting point you know and there's other ones like so the taboos are i mentioned one of them not don't go out of the tabernacle when you've had the oil put on you another one is uh, don't drink strong drink before you go and have this thing on you know uh, you, you're about to take a whole lot of tranquilizers keep off the liquor probably yeah. pretty good advice you know respiratory suppressants like yeah <laughs> yeah yeah exactly disaster uh, um, yeah, and no, I, I thought that was quite interesting. Um, I was looking at the uh, the findings there as well, and uh, how they were burning the, the cannabis and the frankincense. Uh, the, the cannabis was uh, blended up, it seems, with uh, some form of dung, some animal dung, and that that seems that they were doing a slow burning process where they wanted the yeah. slow release over time. And it seemed like the the frankincense was in an animal fat where. They were heating it and vaporizing it again, a, a slow release over time, which means they were probably spending quite a, a period of time in there conversing quite a bit, I'd imagine. <laughs> it's exactly that. I mean, it shows the degree of understanding because the, the chemicals, um, you, don't, you don't burn cannabis and frankincense at, at the same temperature to get the, uh, to get the best effect out of it. Exactly. And I guess another thing which is interesting about the, the Tel Arad um, shrine is that there's two substances two standing stones, two altars, and it looks like two gods, because with frankincense has a long history of being burned in the region. It was burned to uh, Baal, for example, who's the Canaanite god. Um, it was burned to um, Ra, who's the Egyptian god as well. Frankincense has been transported 1,500 miles across robber-infested deserts. Uh, it takes six months on a camel. Um, and that's been happening for probably about 6,000 years, something like that. So this is a very, very old, uh, old trade route, spice route, right? And so that frankincense has been, has been burned to all of the Baals. So Baal is a kind of, um, there are different Baals. It means Lord, basically. So you've got Baal in, in Babylon, for example, the Temple of Babylon. I think, again, it's Herodotus. I'm not entirely sure about that. But one of the commentators notes how many tons of frankincense are being burned each year in the to Baal at the, main at the main altar of the Babylonian temple. Now, the fact that it's got a main altar suggests it's also got another altar, yeah, secondary altar, yeah. Um, here in Tel Arad, at the southern, at the southern tip of the Judah height um, uh, country, let's say, uh, they have the cannabis, they, also, they, they bring cannabis into the mix. And I, the evidence isn't great for this, but there is a bit of evidence that cannabis is connected to Asherah, who's the lion goddess, right? Um, Yahweh once upon a time had a wife and there are inscriptions all around uh, southern uh, Israel. In fact, there's one about 30 kilometers away at a place called uh, Kirbet El Kum, where it says uh, there's an inscription talking, this is dedicated to Yahweh and his Asherah. Yeah, and there's a whole bunch of philologists arguing about what this means, but um, it seems very clear 
that this is talking about Asherah, the goddess, who was the wife of Baal, uh, who was the wife of the other Baal. You know, she's pictures all, you know, these, these, these gods had wives, right, or consorts. Um, so I think this is fascinating, the idea that these, these two gods are worshipped with different um, incenses, and the incenses mix in your brain to, in really complex ways to give a kind of, to give a, a third experience, give something that arrives, and, and that's what happened, you know, the mix of a, a male and a female uh, is, produces a third experience, produces a child, yeah, which, yeah. Is, which is distinct from both. And then that, and then we're talking about suppression. So that actually does get suppressed. The um, the the worship of the of the female deity of Asherah is um, deliberately suppressed in a centralizing movement by um, a couple of reformist uh, kings. And you can write an article about that on Sid News. It's called something like Frankincense Cannabis and the Emergence of Patriarchy. Um, I can't remember exactly what it's called, but if you Google my name and Lucid News and Frankincense, you'll find it. I'll look that one up. Yeah, I was uh, looking at a, a different article. I think it was getting high with the or getting high with the most stoned, is it? <laughs> yeah, it was the most high, yeah. Getting high with the most high, yeah, that was the one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, all, all quite interesting stuff. And I, I think that was the oldest uh, dating of cannabis to be found at a at a shrine as well. Um just kind of pre getting cannabis being linked back even further now with a uh, human history. Right. That's interesting. That's really interesting. I didn't know that. Um, yeah, that was okay. how I first uh, came across the article. Actually, around the shrine, it was like uh, the oldest find of uh, evidence uh, of cannabis being burnt by, by humans. I think it was like uh, 2,300 okay. years old. Um, tell our, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's about right. Uh, you get it in, you get kind of um, papyri talking about its use in medicine in different places. Um, I don't know if that's older kind of medical use. Yeah, and also that distinction between magic and religion. Uh, I, I think the oldest form of evidence I could find on cannabis myself in, in human history was uh, some clay pottery that predates like uh, 10,000 years old that was found over in Asia. And uh, the evidence is basically they used hemp cord to uh, put designs onto the outside of the, uh, the pottery. And uh, that kind of gives an indication that they had hemp fabrics then at that time. So they would have been growing cannabis. And obviously using the flowers. <laughs> yeah, I believe that was Chinese. The Chinese, yeah, that's the one. Yeah. So quite quite old stuff. Um, you know, uh, I, I suppose to, to can move away a little bit from the, the Bible and cannabis uh, and and all that. It's just there's another area of interest uh, that you kind of have expertise in, and um, it's something I've I, I've I tipped my toe in, and uh, I've done a lot of research before on DMT and ayahuasca and stuff. And, and that led me to actually making my own DMT after over a year of research. And uh, I consumed it actually with cannabis uh, in a bong, bong hit, like, uh, and uh, had a one breakthrough experience. And I, I had about maybe four experiences with iOS or with DMT, sorry, in a smoked form. But that one, that very first experience, it, uh, that, that allowed me to just find a newfound um, sense of comfort with the idea of death and the afterlife. I, I used to suffer with uh, insomnia at night time, like uh, badly thinking about the afterlife. I have two daughters myself, and I'd be always wondering, like, oh, geez, what if, you know, what if, <laughs> where do we go? What if I never see them again? Like, and that used to give me great uh, anxiety. And it was about maybe five years ago, I had one experience with DMT, and I never again had a, a bit of anxiety or insomnia around that issue. Um, the, the second time I actually tried it, I encountered um, what I kind of came across as a, uh, one of these uh, deities and then the kind of Indian kind of cultures, the only, it's the closest resemblance I could find. And it was almost a kind of a, you got what you wanted from us, go away, don't come back here for another while. That was the message that I, I translated from it. Like, so it's, uh, it's, it's almost, it's like, there's mechanisms built in upon these things that uh, almost uh, lead you not want to abuse them <laughs> like other drugs. <laughs> not saying that they can't be abused, but yeah, but the the uh, the the Sant the Santa Tami, uh, religion. Um, can you can you just tell me a little bit about uh, that, uh, if you want not mind? Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm curious. Um, just before I go there, sure, yeah. I'm curious. Did you take the instructions from the uh, from the from the Indian god, or did you just, just keep keep boshing it all the same? I didn't go near DMT again for uh, it was about a year and a half. I was at um 
at a music festival and somebody had some changa and um, I took a little puff off it, not enough for any kind of a breakthrough experience, but just enough for kind of visuals of, uh, of the forest and stuff. But yeah, I definitely took that instruction to kind of back off for a while and until I get my, uh, my set right my, in my mindset, the reason for partaking in the ceremony again. Very interesting, because I've got a, a similar story uh, from a friend of mine who um, he was getting quite into DMT and he got a very clear message, stop it. Uh, and uh, he didn't. He said, I'm not taking that from, <laughs> from you know, some part of my brain. Uh, and, um, and he continued and it just stopped working for him. He said, it just, it just stopped working, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, it's quite interesting, isn't it? So, so with, with Daimi, we take those messages very seriously, right? Um, those, those messages will sometimes come through songs that become part of our corpus, let's say, uh, our litany. Um, and uh, Daimi, I mean, what to say about it? Daimi comes out of the Amazon. Uh, it's a syncretic um, mixture of folk Catholicism, indigenous animism, some influence from the European spiritist tradition. And all of this gets put into a syncretic mix uh, at the edge of the, well, yeah, at the edge of civilization, basically, on the border between the town and the, and, and the Amazon rainforest, and gets put into a particular type of ritual by a gentleman by the name of um, Mestri Irineo. I'll show you a picture of him, actually. My wife is currently doing a, doing a picture of him, and I'm quite, I think it's brilliant to show you. Um, so that's what he looks like. Um, very tall black man, looks like that. Um, Artwork. So, yeah, so this dude, he um, was drinking, well, he was a border guard. Um, but when I start the story, he went to go and seek his fortune in the Amazon, basically, uh, we were doing the rubber boom, uh, because Europe was fighting lots of, was fighting wars and needed rubber for its war machine. So there's a rubber boom in the Amazon. This guy went over there, ended up working as a border guard, um, and uh, ended up encountering probably the Hunikuin indigenous people, and they taught him how to use ayahuasca. And he used it um, in a traditional way, which was with um, ikaros and whistling and um, he, uh, kind of, let's say, spiritual healing, uh, normal shamanic stuff. And then goes our legend. Uh, he was looking at the moon one day, and the moon came down to him and asked him to, uh, to, to sing. And he, he said, no, 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 I don't know how to sing. I haven't got a musical bone in my body. And she said, just open your mouth and sing. I'm ordering you to sing. And uh, I'm stripping down the story a little bit, but the guy starts singing and produces the first um, hymn in our, in our book, right? Uh, and then he, so he, he then produced another 131 songs. So his whole book is 132 songs. Um, and those songs contain various teachings, um, set against a Christian backdrop. So you've got um, characters like um, Jesus and you've got characters like uh, José and Maria and all of these people. But then you've also got characters from the, from the jungle. You've got um, Caboclo warrior spirits um, and elemental spirits. I'm not going to mention their name here because we don't mention them outside of ceremony because uh, I'm not um, you know, then you call them into the room and then they're going, well, well, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to make it rain? Or what is it, what am I, what am I doing here? You know, why have you phoned me? Um, so uh, you've got those spirits. And then later you also get the introduction of some from the Orishas from kind of West, uh, West African traditions that also came into Brazil. So it's very much a, a cauldron, a melting pot of different traditions. But that is not to say that it's a kind of free for all. And in fact, it's not, it's quite disciplined. There's a very specific format in Daimi. There's a table in the center. There's a place where the men stand. There's a place where the women stand. There's a dance, which is a two step right and a two step left. And it's going right and left and right and left. And you're playing the maraca, which is a, like a, a percussion instrument all the way through that's keeping you in, in the music. Maraca, we call it in English. That's the one. Um, yeah. Makes me think of Chaz and Dave. Makes me think of awful music in America. But anyway, in Portuguese, it's called a maraca. Maraca, you know, it marks out time. Um, so you've got this. So, so ayahuasca is part of a mix which also involves um, moving geometry of where you're standing in a kind of choreography. It's also involving uh, rhythm, repetitive beats, 
Um, it's also involving rhyme. It's also revolving call and response music. Uh, and all of those things are kind of set in, in motion. So you've got, um, yeah, it's like a moving poem, if you like. And the kind of subjects that are touched on are not thou shalt not, um, you know, or it's not a list of thou shalt nots, you know, the only thou shalt nots, the closest thing to a thou shalt not is don't gossip um, about people and, um, you know, don't argue. And it's uh, uh, most of the words are either about praise of nature or they're about how to live in community and the problems that arise from living community. So it's very much a uh, embodied, in fact, almost it's an urban lineage, right? Mestri Reneo, this um, big tall black man, he brought it out of the jungle from indigenous context. And in fact, we have another legend, which he, he was actually in Peru and he said, are you a good thing or a bad thing? If you're a good thing, I'm gonna take you back to my Brazil. If you're not, I'm gonna leave you here in Peru. So he brought it back and he literally christened it. I gave it a new name, which is Daimi. Daimi means give me. The holy give me is what Santa Daimi means. Um, and then he put it into a context, which was a, a, a group ritual rather than an individual ritual. And that's quite interesting because the, the kind of shamanism that survived the, the conquests, Spanish and Portuguese conquests, is a shamanism where individuals go off on their own into the jungle, uh, sometimes six months or a year, um, very much concerned with healing and, um, uh, yeah, mainly healing and also tribal dynamics. Now, what was there before the Spanish, we have no idea, but we do know that group rituals are much more much easier to police than disappearing off into the jungle for six months uh, and talking to plants. Um, the, the obsession with healing or the focus on healing may be, it may be a new thing because the Spanish and the Portuguese brought a lot of diseases in, a lot of trauma, which might have kicked off a whole lot. So we don't know. And what I'm saying here is we don't know if in old school shamanism there was a group ritual. So the idea that, so Daimi is a group ritual, it's a new thing, but it also may, be, it may have its roots somewhere in, in a much older thing. Um, yeah, there's certain, there's quite a lot of discipline around it. Uh, you know, you're expected to stay in your place. You're expected to, you know, if you feel sick, you're expected to, as, as you get more into it, as you get more skilled with it, you're expected to kind of, uh, you know, sometimes you puke obviously, but to be able to hold that and deal with it. Um, it so the whole ritual is constructed in a way that makes the experience very much more navigable, I think, than DMT. Um, I'm not saying you can't get anything out of DMT and clearly people do. And you know, your story there is a good example of that. DMT sometimes feels to me like a bit of a roller coaster, where you, where you get on somewhere, crazy stuff happens, and then you get off and you're pretty much the same place as you were, although you may have had an interesting experience. Dime is not like that. Dime is a bit more like a bicycle, where it comes on slowly, you can navigate it, you're getting used to the ritual and stuff. So by, by the time you're kind of freewheeling down, uh, you know, down, down, a, down a hill seeing beautiful countryside um, and more, uh, it's, it's a lot more navigable. It's a longer, it's a longer ritual. It's for me, our, our rituals can be uh, all night, basically. Um, we drink and sing and we drink and sing and we drink and sing and that's all we do. Um, and um, yeah, I, I guess another thing about Daimi is that we are, we do it on our feet. And then we're expected to go out into the world and take that, take what we've learned with us and then apply it into the world, right? Um, and part of that is, um, which is different to a niche shamanic way of doing things, which is that you go and you have a big experience and then you go back to your world um, and you get the whole big download all at once and then, every, and then you, know, you know stuff about the universe. We're a little bit different. Like we go back to it and back to it and back to it to kind of develop that relationship. Uh, really explore the area yeah yeah yeah, explore yeah. The area. Yes, there, there is a certain learning that goes on in there uh, de definitely with the dmt there's a, a confusion and um certainly a, a short-term memory loss too as well because of the everything that happens in such such a short space of time so i'd imagine there is a bit more of um uh, an ability to kind of remember and maybe kind of jot down record what it is that you had uh, the experience you've had the information you might have received upon it like yes uh, well not much not so much the jotting down because the ritual specifies what you do and what you do is you dance and sing uh, yeah. so if you know in the break you can go right down at the end you can go right down often people 
you know, I've, I've run out of sessions and I've immediately started writing books, you know. In fact, my, my books, after a year of drinking Daimi, I was then at a party somewhere and someone offered me a bong. <laughs> and um, I had quite a kind of public event, really. It was, uh, it was pretty unseemly, I think. It was, I was in Japan, I was at a Japanese party. And you're not meant to really have a kind of Kundalini experience at a Japanese party, but I was there, uh, like this. And uh, people were like, to my ex-wife, who's this weirdo you brought along to the party? Um, and, um, and then I went home and I started writing. And I, I, I wrote, I started writing what I called these secrets, right? Uh, scraps of paper, which then went into an envelope. And, and about 80 of these over, you know, like you mentioned you're an insomniac. I was an insomniac and then it all kind of switched and I became a, a, a graphomaniac at night because suddenly this idea would go ping. Uh, and I'd start writing it down and I wrote, you know, a massive amount of text and, and I spent the next, well, ever since then really unpicking it and publishing books out of it. So that was the, that was the, like the base text, all the ideas that came in that year of downloads became the root text to, um, well, that book, which is my first book, Science Revealed. And then this book, Neuro Apocalypse, which is my second book, this one's about what goes on in the brain. Uh, with revelation and linguistics and a whole load of stuff. Um, I'll talk about them in a minute. And then also a third book, which I haven't even got around to writing. So that was, you know, we're going back like um, uh, like 15, 16 years or something. And I'm still unpacking all of the stuff that, yeah. all the stuff that downloaded in that first year. Um, so I guess my point there is that um, it's, it's revelatory in the sense that, that um, Daimi, and other things as well, you know, this, 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 this mix or, uh, in the tabernacle was very specifically used to introduce you to Yahweh. It was meant to give you a vision and an experience of something which you don't normally experience, right? That's what we call an apocalypse. Apocalypse means the lifting of the veil. Um, that's what the, the Greek term apa is a way and kaliptin is a veil. And then in English that becomes revelation, revelation, where vellum is a veil. Another word like that is discovery discovery all those words point to the same kind of thing um so uh, you know in the in the in the in the israelite example who was meant to have this apocalypse only two groups of people the priests that they may minister unto unto me which is what yahweh says so as a priest you have to have the oil put upon you and you ha and you do that in order that you have an experience of yahweh hello mate it's been nice and quiet this is sammy um there's another revelation that came during the ayahuasca ceremony um and um i've got lots of pasta okay when you go when you go downstairs and eat more pasta. <laughs> so uh yeah so the priests had to be anointed with this stuff in order that they could have this experience of yahweh when a king became a king that's what he had to do he had to be anointed in order that he could he could you know it says um uh and samuel anointed david in the midst of his brethren and the spirit of Yahweh came upon him from that day forward, right? So it's a very specific experience of Yahweh, so you can then go forward and, and occupy that space between the tribe and the gods. So that's what the king does. The king is the authority of the gods, and the priests are the, let's say, the, um, the caretakers or the ritualists of the gods, right? Um, but we have a similar thing. I mean, it's much more democratized uh, with Daimi, um, but... In the shamanic, I'm not talking about neo-shamanic, but in the traditional shamanic setup, you would go to the shaman with your illness or your bad luck or whatever it might be. The shaman would drink normally and then come back and say, okay, you've got this problem because you've been cursed by that person. You need to, you know, throw three leaves in the river or whatever it might be. Um, uh, and I'm not demeaning that. I'm just saying, um, you know, that sounds like a flippant example. I'm not saying that that's um, primitive or anything. I think there's a whole lot of power and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, and truth in those in those um, paths of disease as well. Um, but our ritual is different. Our ritual is a group ritual where everybody drinks, everybody goes together, everybody has their audience, um, sees things. And in the instructions, you know, we've got instructions like you're not just there to see beautiful things, but to correct your errors. So there's a very specific um, agenda with Daimi, uh, yeah. which is to make yourself the kind of person who is better to live in community. And it gets on and, you know, resolves arguments in a, in a, in a nicer way, let's say. Which is why I think I encountered that uh, entity on that second one is because I didn't have that uh, set, setting made out in my own mind. Uh, 
it was literally, I was one evening, I was bored and I was like, right, let's, let's try some DMT. And um, no, the DMT knows when, when you're just messing around. Like, <laughs> so I think like these, these rules uh, that you have in place, like there, there are more guidelines for better experiences. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very interested in the Santa Daimi religion. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's, um, it comes out of uh, a lot of experience. You know, it was it was the man who drank for I think he drank for sixty years or something. Mm -hmm. uh, and 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 the way the way that the, the the tradition was built up is quite interesting. Like for example, uh, at the beginning there weren't that many songs, um, and they used to repeat these songs over and over again all night. Um, more songs came into the into the litany. Uh, more books, more people receiving songs, right? And these songs, by the way, they're not, they don't sit down and write the songs. The songs are something that's kind of come into your head as an earworm, or it might be a dream. You might wake up from a dream and write it down, something like that. Um, uh, they have, they have secrets in them, which are, even to the person who's received the song, can be, can be revealed over years later. Um, but, so there's one occasion where someone with one of Mestri's early followers, he says, oh, um, I saw something uh, really interesting during the session and Mestri said, oh, what do you see? And he says, well, we're, when we're having a party down here, they're having a party up there as well. Uh, and Mestri goes, oh, that's very interesting. And uh, what else? And he says, well, when, when, when they've got something up there that we don't have down here. They've got vivas, right? Which is, you know, it's a series of kind of shouts where you say, viva divino pai eterno, viva. And that means hooray for the divine eternal father. Viva, hooray, right? Viva is a, traditionally in Brazil, you might say, Viva Brazil, that means hooray for Brazil. Um, so, and there's this kind of long string of vivas that we say, which is the moment where everyone gets to shout Viva, it's quite fun. And so Mestri says to this, this follower, oh, that's interesting. So if they've got vivas up here, we should probably get some vivas down here as well. And you're going to be the guy who, 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 who gives them. So the way the tradition, I'm, I'm making the point here that um, with syncretic religions, and particularly those involving folk Catholicism, people tend to get an idea that the Catholic Church is this massive monolith which just rolled over the ancient cultures and imposed their own uh, dogmas. And that is the case in, in many places. Um, but right, on the, right in the jungle, you get all kinds of interesting things going on with priests and kind of mushroom priests in, in, in the jungle here and there. And, and this is a tradition which arose out of the, out of the Amazon itself obviously with the influence from the, from the Portuguese and from the kind of papal um, Catholicism, but also um, a, a, a genuine expression of their own um, local divinities and local spirits. And, 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 and like that example shows, it wasn't just one man uh, producing the thing and it wasn't even just one, you know, and he would, uh, he would have said it was his, um, his guiding spirit or the queen of the forest who was doing that. Um, but yeah, there were other people who would add other things, you know, so this syncretism that, and again, that's not to say that adding anything is a good idea, but adding something under the influence or under the, under the watchful eye of a master who really knew his way around ayahuasca, uh, that is another thing. Yeah. Where is the, uh, the Santa Daime religion center? Is it Brazil? Is that the kind of a, uh, yeah, Brazil, HQ? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, Brazil. So um, Alto Santo is in the. Hmm. Well, basically, what happens is so this guy Mestre Reneo, he um, he had his own encampment in a place called Villa Ivanechi, and uh, uh, this is in a part of the world which is everyone's very short, little caboclo jungle people, and he was a massive tall black man. He was two meters tall, really, really tall. Um, and a lot of his followers had also come from the other side of Brazil in the rubber, in the rubber boom. So he had an encampment and lots of black people around the encampment and the authorities heard about it and there was an order sent out to close it down. So the police turned up with guns, surrounded it and with orders to either shut it down or, or for them to basically cease and desist or for them to like violently close it down. Mestri comes out and the, uh, the officer says, are you going to, are you going to, um, surrender basically and he says uh well no he said he's basically are you going to stop this devil worship because they thought it was devil worship bear in mind that Messi was born you know two years after slavery was abolished in brazil brazil was the last country to abolish slavery um it still is a very racist country as you can see with the current administration and um this was a man who had learned 
the techniques of a, of a people that have been oppressed since first contact with Europeans, right? So he understood about state power and he understood how to move around and, and exist within state power. Anyway, so the guy comes out, says, you're going to cease and desist. He says, no, he gets arrested, taken to what is now Rio Branco and interviewed. And by the end of the interview, Messi Rene has managed to convince these people, the authorities, not only that he's not worshiping the devil, but that he's doing good work. And they give him a chunk of land in what's uh, in Alto Santo, which is now a bairro, like a, a neighborhood of, um, of Rio Branco, which is a, a town in the, in the north of Brazil, in the, in, in the Amazon. Okay. Yeah, the north. Um, now, an interesting thing happened there because Mestri got to, got to this town and he said, hmm, we need to plant food. Uh, and he started planting loads of food and all his followers started planting loads of food and cultivating. And shortly after that, an English guy went out there, stole a seed, uh, took it to London to visit gardens and propagated it and started producing rubber. And then the arse fell out of the whole rubber beef and there was, a, there was a massive depression in the area and there was a famine and people started flooding in from, from, the, from the jungle into this, into this urban centre. And Mestri Yone and his followers were producing 40% of the food during a famine, right? So this is another kind of example of, of revelation, let's say, of him, at least in his actions, acting like he had foreseen something coming and saying, okay, right, we need to do something about this. So he's a local hero. And that area of the town is named after him. And then Ayahuasca then got banned another couple of times in Brazilian history, but each time it's managed to overcome the ban. Think and that was when it kind of expanded. Um, it got expanded to a certain side and the police said, oh, don't know, we've got to do something like this. Got a whole load of scientists to go and study it and said, oh, actually, um, like, for example, there was a big uh, CONAD study about it. They said, well, these people are um, uh, well-behaved, law-abiding, and they exemplify all the things that we think are good about Brazilians. So we're going to let them do their thing. Do you think the uh, current pre president over there, Bolsonaro, or Bolsonaro um, is going to have issues with the... Uh, which ourselves, uh, the, the ayahuasca arrows and uh, the other guys in there, because it uh, seems like he has his eyes set on a lot of damage on the forests. Yeah, he's definitely got an agenda. Um, yeah, and he's been specific about it. We need to do away with these. I can't remember the exact phrase he used, but like I think it was communist homosexuals and and and, uh, and ayahuasca drinkers. Yeah. Um, having said that, he's been for a while and he hasn't done anything particularly no. yet. Uh, so, I mean, who knows? There's, there's political authorities, and then certainly in my mind, there's other authorities. Uh, and um, some of them have more power than others, let's say. But it seems even outside of Brazil, though, that the, this kind of uh, culture now is uh, it's growing out of there. there is, I, I even came across one, uh, more than one, actually, uh, recently in Ireland. They're offering... Uh, ayahuasca retreats uh, they're working with cambo and other kind of uh, traditional they're, they're calling them um, astral remedies uh, they're calling them and they're, they're offering retreats for people uh, it's not not the cheapest of uh, either like but uh, i'd imagine you're working with hopefully professionals down there who <coughs> want to guide you well through the, the ceremonies but um yeah I, I just was very surprised by that I, I thought it was illegal here in ireland but uh, it seems that these guys are operating away uh, uh Anya. it's a great i mean it's, it's legally gray i'm not sure what the irish legislation is but in england um yeah it's kind of legally gray yeah uh, a lot of the that. substances are I, I, one. But yeah i mean yes but then you've got the inc being the international narcotics control bureau which specifically exempted ayahuasca from the Misuse of Drugs Act, and you know, it's complicated, it's, it's legally very complicated. So, different jurisdictions in Europe have interpreted those European laws differently. And, um, I guess the main, uh, uh, the main thing I would recommend to people who are interested in ayahuasca, or however you want to take it, is to, um, to know the person who's going to be doing it. Uh, is it the person that you would leave your newborn child with for an evening, right? Because basically, you're putting, you're putting. I don't be dramatic here, but you're putting your life in someone's hands. And m most of the time, ayahuasca is is, plain, is, is absolutely wonderful. Um, but as a friend of mine says, you don't tell a sailor by how he handles the uh, how he handles the um, the calm waters. You tell him you tell a sailor by how, how they handle the storm, 
Yeah. And there are certain there are certain things which require training uh, in order to deal with. So that's good. so that would be what I, what, what I would say. You know, I, I, I would I ask is very strong. Um, you want to make sure the person you're doing it with is someone you instinctively trust. Check out with people that they've already you know have already been to them. Uh, and, and trust your feelings on this. It's um, important to do background work, all right, Stephanie, when choosing a, a place to go do this, especially if you're going to, out into a forest uh, and read some. And watch out specifically for. There's a group, um, there's a guy called Varela. Um, I think his, one of his, he, Ayahuasca International is one of his organizations. I think they're also called Inner Mastery. That mm. guy's a monster. He's an absolute monster. Uh, I, being called in to deal with a couple of people who've, who've come out of uh, out of his sessions in particular. Uh, I've heard all kinds of awful things about um, playing Eminem music and people having sex in the corner of the, of the, of the rooms and all kinds of abuse going on, oh, jumping out of windows. You know, this is, um, so just be very, very, just be, just be careful, man. Look into it, use your, use your mind, use, use your thoughts. And it's not, it, 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 Ayahuasca is not a joke. It can be a lot of fun. Uh, and it can be very, very revealing. But, uh, oh, um, yeah, tremendous respect for these plants and the uh, the substances within them. Um, I, I think it's very interesting. Um, like when we look at cultures and how they use them. And you said something there a few minutes ago, and, and it made me think of this: is uh, judge a man not by how he or the sailor by the calm waters, but how he handles the stormy waters. Uh, it's like uh, they, they use the ayaboga in African cultures as a kind of a coming of age ritual as a way of learning uh, who to bring on a hunting party and who not to bring, basically. That's kind of how it was explained to me now in a very simplistic way, that like uh, during the ceremony, like you're going to find out like who's the guy who's going to run away and leave you get eaten by the lion, rather than who's the guy who's going to stand with you and your mates and fight them off like in a bigger pack. Um, <laughs> it's just something that they, they use in Africa uh, as a coming of age ritual. But uh, then there's mushrooms being used in other uh, say in smaller parts of uh, i think is it mexico or in south america where they also have it as a coming of age ritual with some of the psychedelic mushrooms for, for the younger people 12 13 kind of, uh, in age um what, what would be your kind of uh, an idea of um of an appropriate age for introducing a person to uh the daimi uh, perspectives <laughs> Just, uh, hopefully that's not too controversial um, thing to be asking now but that's a very yeah. That's a very complicated question. Um, <laughs> I'm going to go back to the African example. Yeah. Um, uh, in um, yeah, so in pygmy fang community, pygmy communities, fang communities, Gabonese communities. <coughs> um, yeah, it's when it's when a boy becomes a man or when a girl becomes uh, a woman, and. Um, it's used, just kind of sidestepping your question, basically, it's used in this culture in England, uh, in the UK, uh, a lot, it's kind of well known for um, treating, um, treating addiction, you know, kind of famously good for treating addiction. And addiction is, one part of it is not being able to say no. And one of the ways that we tell a child from an adult is, you know, I didn't even notice my son coming in here saying, can I watch something? You know, that kid, and I don't, but if, if I put him in front of computer generated trucks, he will watch them all day and he'll be delighted. You know, um, I make the call on his behalf because he's not old enough to know when to say no. Right. I've had enough now. I've had enough chocolate now. I've had enough trucks now. Um, so, yeah, Iboga is a really interesting one. Um, Iboga, it's not something that people go back to very much. You know, normally people take a, a, a dose as they're coming of age. They might take um, small doses other people are coming of age and then even the practitioners in this country or in other countries uh, in, in the ones I've talked to they'll take it a few times and then and then they'll take it they might say something like why are you taking me again and be like the DMT uh, said to you um, <clears throat> there was a case uh, I, I, I found of a gorilla um, that was spotted eating a boga waiting for the effects to come on and then challenging the dominant gorilla in a, in a pack right um so that stuff has been eaten for a very long time and that particular example there is um let's say upending the uh the, the order you know um of society you know in, in one level which is um which is also a theme that you get in the new testament 
about um, complete reversal of roles and uh, um, you know authority figures being being knocked down. Um, no, I'll leave that. <coughs> um, so definitely, I think that it's appropriate for adults who are still children to take psychedelics and take them in large doses. You know, if you don't know how to say no, and most of us don't, man. We live in a, in a society where we don't have initiation rituals. We don't have hardship generally. You know, we're, we're currently dealing with quite an interesting, you know, kind of forced enclosure, which is, a, you know, that was, a, that was a type of uh, initiation ritual back in the day, sticking people in a cave for ages and then uh, seeing what they're like when they came out. And so I wonder if this whole, I think, insane response to um, a virus which kills very old people who are already sick, um, and maybe that's a controversial comment, um, seems to be, you know, would that have happened if we lived in a place, in a, in a society which actually had rituals of um, initiation that could separate separate children from adults you know the idea that you're meant to live forever that's a very childish way to think i think you know the idea you're meant to be comfortable forever the idea that the state is meant to look after you that your health is um the state's business is extremely childish i think you know uh i've got i've got to mention you've got two daughters you know for the time being i'm happy to pick up their orange peel after them but that's when if they're adults and, 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 and the authority figure is still picking up after them and shouting at them when they've left their orange peel out, something's gone seriously, seriously wrong. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah there is definitely a lot out of whack in our society today. Um, I, I think you, you mentioned something there, the, the people being locked in a cave now and uh, seeing what they're like when they come out. Um, I, I think around the world, uh, wherever these kind of lockdown measures have been imposed anyway, and people have been told stay at home and like there's a lot of stuff that happens behind closed doors that people don't know about and it's uh you know but uh, I, I think going down the road when when people do get to come out of the caves again that we're going to see a, a a large increase in certain mental health problems you know people with various issues that uh, get exacerbated now by the current situation do you um like I, i've heard a lot of people saying this but would you uh kind of echo that while people are saying that uh, psychedelics uh things like ayahuasca and others would be very beneficial to be able to be in the hands of professionals anyway not not recommending people just go home and do this on their own um but if they do you know be well educated on how you do it but <laughs> do you think that's something that should be uh, explored uh, going down as a, as a, a way of i don't know reducing the burden on the state People being able to take care of themselves because uh, I think that's what psychedelics enable myself. And yeah, yeah, so. it kind of reminds me. Of, um, there's a Philip K. Dick story where it's kind of like a Great Expectations uh, vibe, where this guy from the past ends up in the future and he meets a child, and um, the child says to him, "What kind of therapy do you do?" The assumption being that in the future everybody's a therapist, <laughs> <laughs> and I think you know certain types of mental health conditions we're seeing it all already you know domestic murders have doubled that was the last time i looked um uh lockdown in prisons you know there's there's, there's people as young as 16 who've been in their cells 23 hours a day for what is it a year now um yeah there's no way we're getting out of this without some serious damage um a friend of mine uh has a friend who works in a call center and I, and it's it's, it's it's kind of an abuse line um <clears throat> No, I think it's actually, but she was getting, they're getting a whole load of um, children basically calling up, uh, dealing with their abusers because people are locked at home. You know, it's one, it, it, there's, there's, there's violence in, in a lot of houses, but there's also the kind of avoiding of violence. And, you know, if, if, you, can, if you can keep your head down and stick it, stick it out of your room and then go to school, that's one thing. But if you've got your head down in your room just for months and months and months and months and months with no end, um that's that's going to do some serious damage yeah. so how things sorry about that no. so how how we emerge out of this um i think traumatized yeah I, I think it's as simple as that i think we emerge traumatized uh, most people i think you know a lot of people have you know done their given up their shitty jobs and started creative projects and um, loads of people started podcasts for example <laughs> um but um uh, which is which is a, which is a great thing, you know. There's com all these conversations going on where, where they weren't before, um, but yeah, we are we are we are 
very much, mm, we don't know what we're going back into. That's the other thing. It's not like we're coming back out into a system where, okay, that's where, that's where, the, uh, that's where this thing is and that's where this thing is. We're coming back into a system where, who do you trust, you know? Who at this point, some people trust the WHO, but I don't, you know? Um, who, who trusts, uh, you know, as an American at this point, going back out, I mean, I, I, I might even want to stay at home, you know? <laughs> what are you going to do? So, yeah, so come back to your question. I think, uh, yes, I think, um, and we're seeing it already, you know, um, whole cities in the US are, are decriminalizing um, psychedelics. Right. Uh, there's a couple of problems. One of them is what you mentioned there about um, professionals, right? Uh, when I hear someone like Michael Pollan, for example, who is uh, well done for getting a book out, um, and it's you know obviously much more successful than my book, so maybe this is a bit of sour grapes. But there's someone who um, doesn't really know that much about psychedelics, saying yes, I want to take them when it when it's uh, a state-approved doctor and it's in a clinical setting, and I'm thinking, well, I, I, I don't take anything from a state-approved doctor anyway in the first place. That's why. When I got leishmaniasis, there's a story I didn't tell, but when I was in the jungle, I got a really serious parasite and I was sick for eight months and everyone around me told me I had to take antimonium tartrate injections. And with background in history of medicine, philosophy of medicine, and I, I know how these things work, and I know how the, um, how the frontier is basically a colonial frontier. And I was like, no way, you're not having my body. And I, I drank ayahuasca for, for like five months pretty much every day in order to deal with it, right? So what I'm saying is just because it's just, the fact that it's a state approved doctor for me is almost a turn off, you know, really? How many doses have you had, you know? Do I, do I, do I really need you to be able to do, um, you know, to get me, to, you know, just next door I can have my kidney taken out if I need to. And uh, if I, it's, not, it's not the appropriate setting. A hospital is not the appropriate setting. Same way it's not appropriate for childbirth, you know? You go to hospital when you're ill. I'm not going to drink ayahuasca because I'm ill. Mm -hmm. uh necessarily i don't i don't buy that whole kind of medical paradigm so yeah it depends who the practitioners are and what we've seen with let's say making comparison with the um decriminalization legalization of cannabis the people who really knew, in canada for example people who really knew what they were doing in growing it uh they've been pushed out of business they've been um marginalized and who's got the contracts people some of them are people who are in the police before you know um has that made the quality of cannabis go up no i don't think it has you know and so so if that's what's happening with just commerce and then you're looking at healthcare and you look at all these like, biotech companies moving into healthcare getting healthcare is getting massively capitalized in a way that it never has been before yeah and i've just got here you know i've got like uh letters that i cleared up before we started letters from desperately getting me to have my kids to have a flu jab Right, uh, you're getting the same hassle. Saw an you know? advert on YouTube yesterday, in between some of those trucks moving around, there was an advert on YouTube for a uh, it was a little doll that shivers and says, "I'm cold," and then you stick a thermometer in its mouth and give it medicine. I think this is a new thing, man. <laughs> like, uh, so do I trust the state to manage my health? No, fuck off. No, I really don't. I really don't. No way near me, please. Um, I don't trust them to manage my money. I don't trust them to manage my health. So that is a little bit of a worry. Um, I, I, I like the fact that there's quite a, a big and intelligent resistance to this. Um, Eric Davis is flying the flag uh, in many ways uh, with, uh, as a critical voice about the commercialization. Uh, Symposio is another one uh, who've been quite aggressive on what happens with commercialization of, uh, of psychedelics. So I think it's a really interesting moment because um, psychedelics are like nothing else in medicine anyway. Yeah. Uh, they, they inspire, I think, a certain type of um, anarchistic thinking or certainly, let's say, um, autonomous thinking, right? right. They, they inspire people to believe that they have um, control over their needs, right? Uh, and these things which are beyond their control, whether it's death, or whether it's state power, you know, death and taxes, um, we start to feel like we do actually, do I really need to pay taxes? You know, um, <laughs> do I really need to buy into this thing? Mm, uh, maybe not. So, and again, it, well, interesting, it reminds me of the, of the Gnostics um, in a way, because um, when going back, going, going back to the, the ancient world, yeah. the Gnostics uh, didn't take authority from a bishop. They took authority from visions that they had, from dreams they had, 
uh, you know, you get lines from like the, the Gospel of Mary, for example, says, don't follow, this is Jesus, comes to Mary in a vision and says, um, don't follow, follow any laws that the lawmaker makes, right? Um, it's very, very difficult to control people who have, think they have, or in fact have a direct prophetic link with invisible spirits who are telling them stuff that the present isn't telling them and in a much more um, in, in, in song rather than in stupid tweets and sound bites. Yeah, it's much more compelling. Makes them, and make, I, I don't, so I get, basically what I'm saying is I don't know if psychedelics can be put into the bag. I don't know if they can be controlled. You know, um, I'm skeptical of, um, I, I, like, I like the fact that people are doing microdosing, mm -hmm. uh, but this idea of, of the microdose is, um, improving your work capacity uh, and making you more productive and all that kind of stuff. Fine, that's one way to use drugs, go, go for it. But then there's also the mega dose and that really opens up whole other world, whole other, you know. And this is like for me, I'm thinking about my early, kind of my, my teens when I, when, I, when I got into smoking weed. It was very, very clear. Like that was, it was blindingly clear. First, the law is wrong. Secondly, I'm capable of generating much better ideas than uh, any of these author authority figures um, than I've, uh, that sounds a bit, that sounds a bit, sounds a bit arrogant, doesn't it? But right. you know, <laughs> psychedelics fill you with, with self-confidence and um, autonomy, I think. Yeah, they definitely do give you power, like, which is again, why I think the, the Bible is a bit of a tool of disempowerment and how they don't really tell you the truth on a certain amount of things like that, I suppose, really. Um, I, I actually echo uh, your opinion there on uh, the worry around the commercial commercialization of these things. I, I seen one company trying to put a patent on uh, on the production of synthetic psilocybin there. Um, that that kind of made the news there a while back. But I also echo that I called for the legalization in, in of cannabis in Ireland and uh, following what happened in in Canada. Like uh, that is a major worry that if if any of these things are to be legalized or regulated that they're they're not going to be in in the hands of the professionals like say if ayahuasca was out there they probably would try to put it in some capsule form and you know don't go work with the santa daimies they, they talk all sorts of nonsense go down to your pharmacy and get it down there and listen to your government and the state approved nonsense that they'll spout about it <laughs> um yeah, I mean, and, and what, something you just mentioned there is interesting. The, uh, I, th I think it was Compass that was trying to, uh, or one of their derivative companies that was trying to patent um, psilocybin. Yeah. Um, the one particular way of manufacturing uh, psilocybin. So what happened, uh, another, another organization did it with a, a better, a better um, what do you call it, a better route to manufacture it and made it off patent, right? So this is the response from intelligent um psychedelic fiends and they know their stuff you know like like they uh, a lot of us in the scene we get really really into it you know and um whether whether you go down the line of scripture or whether you go down the line of psychopharmacology or whatever it is you do these are people who are autodidactic learn their own stuff and and have weapons against uh, against the state i get the feeling you know like ayahuasca the nature of ayahuasca is to make you vomit it's to challenge you uh disturb you uh disturb that which is fixed, you know, from an alchemical perspective, alchemical perspective to make fluid that which is fixed and make fixed that which is fluid. Yeah. So it pulls the rug out from underneath you. Um, um, and, and, and I get the feeling that it's kind of doing that to society as well. You know, it's rocked up. It's made, it's, it's made a big reaction. Mm -hmm. um, hasn't managed to, I mean, there's, there's loads of ceremonies going on all over the place in the world now. So they haven't managed to stem the tide or stop it. Um, but it has provoked a load of art and um, a load of media and a load of um, it's, it's almost like you know in many ways the state has really revealed itself you know yeah. through through law law whether it's law uh, well, all the way back to Deuteronomy law has been about pro protecting the assets of the of the moneyed class or the property class um, and that's kind of obvious from a kind of anarchist critique, but it's not obvious in your own life until you're, until, well, put this the other way. Um, when people's sons and daughters get arrested for smoking weed, mm -hmm. that sets up, that sets, that sets a parent against the state. Either they, okay, am I with the state? Is my, is my son a bad boy? Actually, he's not that bad, is he? He's just like smoking weed and actually he's really nice, you know? So those kind of, um, 
I think when the state overreaches, and it very much is and has done with, with psychedelics and with drugs generally, um, it shows itself and it shows more and more of the vomit <laughs> that's inside it, reveals more and more of its nakedness and its ugliness. And I think that could only provoke a reaction. Uh, and even if it's not a reaction right now, you know, it's a kind of simmering distrust. And as our institutions fall away, and they are falling away, um, I hope we have enough people who are liberated, creative, and uh, know a little bit about dealing with their own shit rather than flinging it onto other people, which is something you definitely have to learn when you're deep in, you know, three, three tabs of acid. Um, <laughs> then, um, yeah, so, I, I mean, I'm kind of wandering a little bit, but I'm, I'm quite hopeful at the moment. I think this kind of group initiation that we're going through, yeah, it's going to have awful effects, it's going to have awful impacts, it's already having awful impacts. And I think people, uh, there will be a lot of people who won't recover. But I think that the direction of um, late stage capitalism, to use a lazy term, um, the new world order was like a, you know, a train heading towards a cliff, right? And at least there are people jumping off the train. At least there are people trying to wrest controls of the driver uh, from the driver at this point. So I, I'm hopeful by, from the introduction of psychedelics, from more stuff coming out about psychedelics, even with all the problems that we've got with commercialization, even with all the problems we've got about you know, sadly, when people go and hurt themselves when they've taken psychedelics and they don't know what they're doing, you know, it's nothing compared to smoking or drinking or anything like that. But these things do happen and we need to think about them, you know. So um, but I've, been, I've been obsessed with the apocalypse since, since I was a teen, since I was in my teenage years, before I even knew what the word meant. I was, I was nervous about the end of the world. And these last, this last year has made me quite hopeful just because I'm seeing the machinery of state, just, just the gears of state all just <laughs> crunched together, you know. Yeah, certainly interesting times. Um, Grant, Danny, I'm I, I just aware that uh, we're just closing on to nearly two hours now. Sorry for um, eating up much of your time. Um, unless you want to go on for another two hours. <laughs> I think that's another thing to do, but I mean, I'm very, very happy to talk. Uh, it's been lovely talking to you, Martin. Oh, it's um, a pleasure as well. Um, come here, can, what, what can we expect from uh, yourself? Uh, did I hear that uh, you're working on a book currently? Or is there one to be launched? <laughs> well, let me tell you what you, can, what you can read that's already there, right? You've got Science Revealed. This is uh, my first book. Um, it's about... Uh, the history of science, it's about the place of revelation in science, right? Um, how things were discovered. It's, it's about people sitting in car parks and immediately discovering uh, the Calvin cycle, uh, which is how photosynthesis happens. It's about Tesla um, downloading, you know, Tesla lying on his couch and having visions of the of robotics uh, and um, all the, you know, the hundreds of patents that he took. He never did a calculation there. Um, it's about the place of psychedelics in that story of history of, of history of science, but also meditation, also um, hypnagogia, which is the state in between sleep and wakefulness. Uh, and it's also about how, how scientific institutions, um, whether they are universities or journals, how they take that um, revelatory experience of the scientist when they discover, discover when they have an apocalypse, mm -hmm. how they take that and they put it through the priestcraft of journals and then the marketplace of uh, pharmaceuticals companies and stuff like that and how it comes down from revelation to us, which is again, actually, I think the story of the Gnostics, you know, the Gnostics had their revelations and then they got packaged up by priests into a certain, um, into a certain uh, package and then they got managed by um, frontline capitalists, really, if you look in the Bible, um, involved in land grabs and stuff like that. So that's the first book. Um, the second book, which is this one, Neuro Apocalypse, that is much more about um, neuroscience. It's about linguistics. It's about what, uh, what we see, what people see and what they miss and what's going on in their brains when they see things and when they miss things. So I've got comparison of Japanese and English, what Japanese people see, when they're looking at um, a scene, what they record, what they remember, how they remember it, and how it differs, it differs to people who, are, who have English as their first language. I'm looking at um, autism and um, temporal lobe epilepsy. And remember, we talked about it briefly before. When you, when, you, when, you, when you feel a presence, because you're in a migraine aura situation, maybe you're actually feeling an actual presence rather than a phantasm of a presence. Who knows? Um, what's going on in your head is quite interesting. What you then do with it is much more interesting. 
you know. So in the case of Moses going to liberate the, uh, uh, going to liberate the Israelites, according to the story, and in the case of, um, let's say, Carrie Mullis, uh, developing a uh, PCR reaction, you know. Um, what do we do with that, um, with that revelation? Yeah, so that book's going into all, all, all that kind of stuff. The drugs in the Bible are in there. That one's called Neuro Apocalypse. Um, I'm working... <coughs> I'm not doing quite so much writing these days because I run a, an NGO. It's called Rain. You can check it out as um, www.rainumbrella.org, mm -hmm. and it's a, re it's a reforestation organisation. We are supporting grassroots, community-led reforestation with indigenous people and rural Brazilians uh, responding to their own um, the threats of desertification deforestation, land grabs from the government, all that kind of jazz. So I'm doing most of my work these days. I haven't done that much writing recently uh, it's because I've been focusing on, on that. So please check that out. If you want to um, give us some money, uh, then we put it into tree planting projects. But the stuff I am producing at the moment, I, I recently had an article uh, out on um, Lucid News, which was about Tel Arad, frankincense um, and cannabis. I had another one on double blind. So if you search for double blind and Nemo and um, that one's about enzyme in inhibition through the ages. So I'm looking at um, um, ayahuasca and the, uh, the anointing oil. I think something interesting is happening at the moment. When I rewrote this book, <coughs> I didn't change much of it, but I was very careful to be very, to be very careful on, on vaccination. Right, because I didn't know very much about it, um, and um, so I wrote. So I, you know, I, someone made a review. Someone wrote a, a review of this book. It was actually a friend of mine, Dave Lee, and um, he said, um, "Well, this book is really interesting." Uh, and he was, it was a nice review. And he said, "I'm going to come back to something at the end." And he makes his review, and he comes back to something at the end. He says, "But I'm not sure about the main point of, uh, of Danny's argument, which is about vaccines." And I was thinking, "What?" Like, I look back at the book, and I, I'm like, I, I, I mentioned vaccines like two words, he, he mentions vaccine more times in his review of my book than I mention it in my book. My, my, it's a passing comment in one, cha in one paragraph of one chapter. Um, and it's, it's, it's really not an argument. It's not an anti-vax argument. Um, but that's happened. And now I've got uh, somebody else has, uh, 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 on a number of occasions, I've been accused of being anti-vaccination, um, regardless of what I write, because I haven't actually written, I've written stuff about um, WHO, vaccination programs and whether they've worked or not according to their own um according to their own goals and their own uh measurements so i wrote a three-part series on medium i'll pass you some links afterwards and you can stick them in the show notes so i wrote a three-part series on that but i think i am going to write something a kind of intelligent historian of a history of science guide to uh to vaccination basically because regardless of what i write people seem to think i'm anti-vax so if i've got I, you know i've got i i do have a critical perspective on taking a vaccination from any one of five companies all of whom have been busted every single year for the last 10 or 15 years for misleading the public vax i think that makes me curious about you know, if someone served me a drink and I know they've been busted every single year for the last 10 or 15 years for lying to people about what's in the drink, I would think twice about taking it, you know. Um, so there's certain aspects of the whole kind of machinery of um, interventionist medicine and pharmacology. Uh, and the point of that attack is the point of the needle at the moment. So, yeah, I think what I'm saying is I'm, I'm gearing up to write a piece which is going to make me lots of enemies. And I will probably be called an anti-vaxxer um, as a result of it. Um, even though I'm not thinking of the sort. Yeah, that's it. Like, it's easy for people to label you anti-vax when you have any opinions on it at all. Like, uh, I wouldn't be completely anti-vaccine, but I would definitely be certainly anti certain anti uh, certain van uh, geez, certain vaccines. I would be anti. Yeah, <laughs> um, because like there, there's really no need for some of them. Like, uh, and you have to question then the, the motives behind the guys who are pushing them, you know. Um, but look, we won't even get into that. That is a really muddy water to get into, and I don't want to, yeah. Yeah. But um, Danny, um, where, where else can people uh, find you and uh, your work? Uh, I, I think uh, you're Reverend uh, Danny Nemu uh, on Twitter, is it? Uh, yeah, Rev Nemu on Twitter. Uh, so that's R-E-V-N-E-M-U. 
that's where I'm kind of, um, uh, I'm fairly active on Twitter. Uh, I've got a website, which is nemusend, N-E-M-U-S-E-N-D.co.uk, which is rather forlorn, you know, I haven't updated that for a while, but you can um, check out, uh, there's plenty of stuff in there, there's talks. Um, there's a load of podcasts, which I've done on various aspects of, of things. And then if you just Google Nemu, Drugs, Bible, Ayahuasca, um, just Google Danny Nemu. There's loads of stuff all over the place. I'm, I have been quite prolific in, in the past. Yeah, um, recently. My one of my oh, sorry, go for it. <laughs> what were you saying? Sorry? No, I, I caught you recently on uh, Sam Tripoli's podcast there. Uh, he re-released it onto the uh, Tim File Hat podcast. And uh, I listen to him kind of regularly as well. He's quite enjoyable. <laughs> yeah, Sam was fun. Sam was fun. He's got some, he's got some, you know, I wouldn't even say he's got some crazy ideas. He definitely invites some crazy ideas into his studio. <laughs> he does. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Sam Tripoli was fun. Uh, Rune Soup, I've got a couple of, uh, some, I've got a couple of podcasts on Rune, on Rune Soup. Uh, which are really good. And then check out Psychedelic Press. Psychedelic Press is the, the press which publishes my books. And um, there's some other really interesting books out there. There's um, Julian Baines, one of them, Peter Storstead H. Uh, he's another one. <clears throat> um, there's a book on the science of microdosing in there as well. So, um, and yeah. If people do want to buy your book, make sure they go to Psychedelic Press to buy it and not onto Amazon.com. <laughs> Depends where you are, man. Um, it yeah, well, seems yeah, like, yeah, of course. Um, Amazon for, yeah, I mean, that's, that's problematic, isn't it? Yeah, go to Psychedelic Press and buy a book. Unless you live in Australia or something, yeah. uh, in which case, you know. Um, I think majority of you are UK and Ireland listening to <laughs> yeah. Not against any of the majority. <laughs> Danny, um, unless there's any more you want to add, it's, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to be sitting and talking with you and to, to go over this because uh, it's certainly an area I love talking about is... Uh, religion and psychedelics <laughs> i will say yeah i will say, say one more thing um <clears throat> as well as thank you for the opportunity it's been great i really enjoyed it um yes christmas is coming up so even if you don't read books buy my book for someone else who does um but what i, what, what I actually wanted to say was this um uh, in this moment where everyone's excited about psychedelics um the best way i think to proselytize psychedelics this is coming straight out of dimey um, in Daimi, we are forbidden from doing propaganda. Uh, we're forbidden from going out of the session and saying, this is really amazing. I was trying to grab you by the lapels there, but I realized I was on Zoom. Um, this is amazing. You've got to drink it. Um, it will change your life. We are forbidden from being messianic. All of that kind of stuff is out the window with us, right? If we want people to come and drink Daimi, we behave in a way that is uh, moral, interesting, and um, consistent, basically. Uh, if people spot you and say, oh, there's something interesting about you. What is it you do that other people don't do? You might say, well, you know, um, six hits of acid on a Saturday night or a Friday night or whatever it might be. Um, but um, I think I, 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 in this moment where everyone is talking about the wonders of psychedelics, I think it's very important for us to, uh, um, to I, I don't want to be cheesy, but to kind of be the change rather than to advertise the change. Yeah. yeah. So if psychedelics are making you into a better person, into a better father, uh, into a funnier raconteur uh, or whatever it is that they're making you that's wonderful but if you're pushing psychedelics onto people then it, it needs to be um, personality led or let's say morally led you know because one of the problems with um, all religions really um, is that they tend to be quite they tend to proselytize um, okay. uh, Danny enjoy the rest of your afternoon anyway and uh, yeah much love to you and your family man uh, thanks very much take care yeah good luck bye Bye-bye. And guys, there you have it. That was my interview with Danny Nemo. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Absolutely thrilled to have Danny on and to explore these topics of drugs and religion, and especially cannabis in the Bible. Guys, if you haven't already done so, go over and check out Danny's books. Uh, it's Science Revealed and Noro Apocalypse. You can buy them over on the Cypress UK website. So that's cypressuk.com. And uh, you'll be able to buy the books there. Sy is P S Y Press UK. Um, so you'll be able to get the books over there. Guys, that's everything for myself today. Um, be sure to keep an eye out. Uh, hit that subscribe, uh, like and follow button if you haven't already done so. And until next time, guys, stay blessed and keep her lit. Peace.